in South Ohio at Stambaugh Stadium, the Penguins of Youngstown State defending and undefeated national champions. They feel that there's nobody can come into this stadium. Mike Mayock can beat them, including Steve McNair and his all Corn State Braves, and here comes the Heisman Trophy candidate. Well, what they've got to be careful about, Tommy, is they can't let all Corn State turn this into a track meet. They can't let them up-tempo it to a point where we end up with a 50-50 to -50 kind of shootout. They've got to play consistent defense, a conservative offense, and their kind of ball game. Well, if Alcorn State should pull off the upset today, it would be a real good march for the Southwestern Athletic Conference because the SWAC, as it's known around the country, has played 15 one AA playoff games. They have yet to win, including Alcorn State with a record of 0-2. But in fairness to the SWAC, perhaps their best team year in, year out, Grambling, never plays in these playoffs. Well, they get a little bit bigger payday down in Atlanta every year, and you can't blame them. They need the money in the, with the uh, the Grambling game. So, But this is really a nice showcase, not only for Steve McNair, but for this whole club. And Youngstown State, the team with the chip on your, their shoulders, you said, Mike, 11-1 and in Division one AA playoffs. Their only loss in the, that run was the loss in the national championship game year before last. I really got a kick out of talking to the Youngstown State players yesterday. These kids are just absolutely solidified in their opinion that year in and year out, they have the best Division I AA program in the country, yet gain no respect from it. And you know what's great? That we're at a college football playoff game. One AA will determine their champion on the field. You don't have to have an undefeated regular season to get into this thing, and I think that's pretty good. Well, I think Division I A could learn a little something from that. You know, you've got a championship game in every football division and every other sport, yet here it is, maybe the biggest spectacle in the country division one a football and they can't get it done on the field all right the head coach of the penguins of youngstown state is jim trestle and he's had his team in the playoffs 10 seasons actually this is his 10th trip to the playoffs you see his great record in his ninth season nine seasons here at youngstown state across the way in his fourth season at alcorn state is cardell jones the man who says that life will go on once Steve McNair <laughs> matriculates, but it won't be as rosy. <laughs> well, he's a little spoiled also because his first year as a head coach was Steve McNair's freshman year. So the boys from Lorman, Mississippi, in their gold pants, gold helmets, white uniforms, and playing in a weather that is about 50 degrees or so, a crosswind of 10 to 20 miles an hour, and you were telling me, Mike, that they did not bring up any real cold weather gear with them. Now, they really didn't, mostly because they never have an uh, opportunity, if you want to put it that way, to play in cold weather. So they really did get a break, Tom. The weather is fairly benign for this time of year in the Northeast. And the weather, 43 degrees at kickoff. It's a crosswind, 10 to 15, partly cloudy. Alcorn State has won the toss they've elected to receive. And the crowd across the way is standing. In tribute to their Penguins of Youngstown State. Now, the kicker today will be number 14, John Dorma. Therein lies the story. Let's quickly get to the men receiving the kickoff. Glory White is number 12. Dermichi Hobart is 32. And Singleton is number 85. But the kicker, Dorna, number 14 for Youngstown, he's a story. Yeah, they've had problems kicking the ball out of bounds all year. And this week, prior to the first playoff game, they had a kicking contest. And he won it because of placement, not because of distance. The Youngstown State Penguins in their red uniforms with black pants and red and white trim. And here we go. This one will be taken by Singleton on the fly at the 15. Over the 25, he's pounded to the turf at the 27-yard line. That's where Alcorn State will take over. As the wind kicks off, they kick off. McNair at quarterback, of course. The only setback is Tony Bullock, the fullback. Hinton, Ross, McNair, that's Tim McNair, Steve's brother, and Turner, the excellent core of receivers in the offensive line. They'll be tested today. Robinson, Floyd, Graham, Ellison, Phillips, and right off the, shot, off the hop here, let's get a shot of McNair and see if we can tell by the way he moves around what that left hamstring is like, Mike. Yeah, hamstring is a funny kind of injury. If it loosens up enough, we might see vintage McNair. Trips to the lower part of the screen. Three wide receivers to the left, one to the right. McNair from the shotgun. He's got loads of room to run, and he's tacked and fumbles the football. It's picked up by Youngstown State. Fumble on the first play. Jermaine Hopkins picked it up. Did a job that piece forced the fumble. And McNair is limping off the field. Boy, that's a huge play for Youngstown State. What happened here, the inside linebacker, Reggie Lee, took away where McNair was trying to go, which was to his brother. He's forced to bring the ball down, 
kick from the backside by Baptiste, and it's picked up by their premier defensive lineman, Jermaine Hopkins. And you know something, Mike? McNair had tons of room to run had he elected to do so, but he didn't. Maybe that's a clue about that hamstring. Yeah, I think it's pretty tight, Tom. Mike Brungard, number 12, brings out the Penguins of Youngstown State. We'll run down their offense in just a moment. The handoff is to number 32. Marcus, Marcus Colley made the tackle on the handoff. Let's look at the, the Youngstown State offense. Can't, Sean Patton and Matt Gilchrist are listed as the starters behind Mark Brungard. The line receivers are Whistler, Trent Boykin, and Brian Terleski, the tight end. And the offensive line, Miller, Hogg, Samuel, Max Delvicchio, and George Thomas. Nakia Hendricks, substitute tailback, took that first handoff of the game. Picked up seven yards. Hendricks again. He is the tackle at the one-yard line. First and goal at the one as Ellen Tate Bell brought him down. Going behind the right side of that offensive line, Ray Miller and George Tomas. Look at the push they get from the Alcorn State defense. Huge hole. Nikia Hendricks takes it right up the field. Tackled on the one-yard line. You think we're going to see a display of power football from Youngstown today? Youngstown wants nothing more than line that big offensive line up and push the pile all day long, Tom. Well, they go 308, 250, 275, 270, and 270 up front to the Penguins. And they haven't lost the game this year. Again, the give, and the touchdown is to Nakia Hendricks, number 32, and it's 6 nothing Youngstown. We played one minute and 20 seconds. How big a series is that? As a matter of fact, a pair of series for both these clubs. Alcorn comes out, fumbles on the first play. We get three running plays and a touchdown. You know, what's interesting is that their big tailback, Sean Patton, has yet to see any action in this game. They used Hendricks, who was listed as third on the depth chart at the tailback spot. They told me they were going to sneak him in at fullback occasionally, but didn't say anything about starting him at tailback. The place kicker for the extra point is Paul Masoro. Run guard to holder. The kick is up, and the kick is good. We still have only 13 minutes and 40 seconds in to play in the first quarter, and already Youngstown State takes the turnover, and they lead it 7 to nothing. Hello. And as Alcorn State Braves up against it early, trailing 7 to nothing. After he was hit on that first series of plays, he limped off, and three plays later, Youngstown State was in the end zone. Three plays, 25 yards, the goal of a minute and seven. But you have to wonder, on that play where McNair was hit as we looked at Youngstown preparing to kick off again, he didn't run, and he had tons of room to run. You have to wonder about his hamstring as we look at the deep end again, the deepest of which is uh, Gory White, along with Singleton, standing about the 10-yard line. Now, Tom, off the tape I saw this week of him in action, McNair doesn't get hit like that from behind ever. I think that hamstring is really, really impactful. Kickoff for Youngstown State. John Dorma. He handles the kickoff duties. They've had problems, as Mike mentioned, with kickoffs going out of bounds. This one doesn't. It goes to Gory White. Always an adventure at the 10. He fumbles a lot, but he also has a lot of speed, and he holds on this time up at the 35-yard line. Well, the Youngstown State Penguins are as big a dynasty as there is these days in Division I AA. Two national championships, one runner-up. That's in the last three years alone. 57-9-2 and in the 90s, 11-1 in the last three playoffs, and seven straight playoff appearances and 10 all told. Ron Jaworski played quarterback here. Cliff Snap played quarterback here, but Steve McNair didn't play here. <laughs> he might not like playing here. No. I'm sure Jaws, who's a part of our Monday Prime uh, crew, is, is uh, viewing with interest today. Again, the triple wide receiver formation. You will see very seldom, if ever, more than one step back in the backfield with McNair. Lots of time over the middle intended for Tim McNair. Well covered by Reginald Lee. It'll be second and ten. Let's check in with Chris Fowler. All right, Tom. We told you Texas Tech is in the Cotton Bowl, but they were trailing TCU 10-0 early when the redshirt freshman, Debbie Lethridge, scrambles around, looks and finds Jason Lavender. His first touchdown of the year. They're struggling, but they're still down only three. Meanwhile, back here in Youngstown, Chris, it's second down and 10. For Alcorn State, Jerome Harness in at running back. 
instead of Harry Brown, and this is Harness in the flat. He will pick up yardage up to near the 45-yard line, near the first down. Vance Mays, right cornerback on the tackle. Pick up eight yards. Now, you mentioned Harry Brown's name. The reason he's not in a tailback is he's now one of their linebackers yeah. on defense, and this Alcorn State defense has been decimated by injuries this year. Yeah, Harry Brown went both ways, actually, last week against Jackson State. Tony Bullock, their starting fullback, where's number 22, would ordinarily be in a place of Harness, but Harness is in right now. Third down of about a yard. McNair calls his own number and vaults forward. He should have the first down. Seems to me to take off for a lunge like that, you've got to have a well hamstring. Kind of interesting. I didn't expect that at all, but it just shows you they're not set up for any kind of power offense. It's a trip wide receiver kind of look, and they're really not going to line up and go right at any team. No, they're not. Uh, with Alcorn State, what you see is what you get, and what you get is at least three wide receivers on every play, most of the time four and passing the ball about 90% of the time. That's what they do, and they do it well. Youngstown State, no doubt about it, the more well-rounded football team, and the obvious favorite today in their home field. The dare from the shotgun again. Gets away, but can't get away again. And they're gonna call it an incomplete pass. They say his arm was coming forward. Jermaine Hopkins was there again for Youngstown. Two important points to make here. That's the same thing that happened on the first play, and the reason is, is inside linebacker number 56, Reggie Lee, number is bracketing his brother, Timmy McNair, on the steam route. He's forced to hold on to the football. That gives Jermaine Hopkins time to get to the football. Already. He's looking inside yeah. right there for his wide receiver, his brother, Timmy McNair. That was 56. Good angle to see how Reggie Lee gets under the hook pattern. Already McNair has seen more turf in this game than he did last week the entire game against Jackson State. Quick handoff, a draw play call, hoping to surprise the Youngstown defense. Not doing so. Jerome Harness took the handoff, and he'll gain maybe about three. You know, let's give this Youngstown State defense their due. They're ranked number two in the country. They give up a total of 225 yards a game. And what the interesting stat is, only 132 in the air versus what Steve McNair averages, which is 442. Mike, a cold wind today, crosswind 10 to 20 miles an hour. How would that affect Steve McNair's routes? When the wind gusts, it's difficult to throw the ball down the field with 20 to 25 mile an hour gusts. Yeah, it's a different world from Jackson or Lorman, Mississippi, isn't it? A little bit warmer down there, I think, today. McNair going across the middle, and the pass is incomplete, intended for Donald Wass, who is inside the 40 at the 39. And Alcorn State will punt Reggie Brown on the coverage. Once again, Reggie Lee, the inside linebacker, expanded underneath the curl pattern, made him hold the ball. McNair is not throwing the ball on time like Steve McNair knows how to. Chris Castro comes in for his first punt of the day. There's he, number six, Castro, who frankly did not get a lot of work in the regular season. <laughs> and Trent Boykin is back in single safety for Youngstown State. And a timeout has been called by Alcorn in punt formation. Now that's interesting. Well, that's, that's because they only had 10 guys on the field. Let's give Youngstown some credit for that. They have a Ranger unit that blocks punts. They've got eight of them already this unit. So while they figure that out, remember that we have more college football excitement coming your way this afternoon. We'll go between the hedges, Georgia Tech and Georgia, 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific time. The Atlanta Constitution asking last Sunday what has happened to the Georgia Tech program. They got beat by Wake Forest, but if they win today against Georgia, Mike, that makes their season. It sure does. That's a big battle down there. But the interesting thing is I think a lot of steam got taken out of that Tech team on that first game of the season on ESPN where they played Arizona as tough as you can play in so long. What does that say? Entering Super Penguin Zone. <laughs> They're having some fun here with ESPN today. I love the stadium they have here. I was here in the old days with the University of Delaware. We used to have a good rivalry with Youngstown State. They didn't have this nice a stadium then. And the Blue Hens kind of had a couple upsets back in well, those days. We don't want to anger the local populace. <laughs> I want to get out of town safely. All right, Trent Boykin is back in single safety again, number six for the Youngstown State Penguins as Alcorn manages to get 11 men on the field and hold everything. Let's set this up. This is not their Ranger unit. Their Ranger unit is the punt block unit. Their punt return team is in the game right now, and they have one of the best special team groups in the country. Number six, punting to number six. Castro awaits the snap. Boykin awaits the punt. Some pressure on Castro, but it gets over an end over end kick, and here comes Boykin. Got the room. Trent Boykin over the 35-yard line, about the 37. 
Jerome Harness makes the tackle for Alcorn. Could be a long day for Chris Castro, the punter, if he's forced to kick a lot today. That was an eight-man rush, and they almost got it with only eight guys. Nice job here by Boykin, 5'5", 152-pound wide receiver. But there is a flag down. Well, that's appropriate because Coach Dwight Beatty coached here several years ago at Youngstown State. He's credited with inventing the penalty flag, and I guess they just wanted to, to try it out. <laughs> And it's going to go against Youngstown State on a punt run back. Penguins walking backward. Let's listen to the official. Did a dead ball foul. Unsportsmanlike. On the offense. See a neutral crew here today. Mike Stanley out of the big sky. All the officials assigned by the NCAA. It's not the schools once it comes playoff time in 1AA. It's the NCAA that runs things. Especially in this setup the way it is. And so people out there know the home field advantage is determined by guaranteeing a certain number of tickets sold. And Youngstown State guaranteed the most tickets. That's why the game is here. Not because they're seated higher. All right, Youngstown State comes out. With the back split behind the quarterback run guard. In motion goes Boykin. And here's the tailback Patton. Sean Patton who carries the heavy load in the running game. Gains about three. And a host of the Braves bring him down. Really interesting, Tom. I don't know why they started the game with Hendricks at tailback. Hendricks is a 6'2", 200-pound sophomore. They go in and score the touchdown. The kid that just carried the ball, Sean Patton, he's an 1,100-yard rusher this year. Dan Inglis lined up that last play. A substitute fullback. He's listed as a second string uh, performer in the general Patton's platoon. Is here to take in this game with a shutout crowd. All the games here at Youngstown sold out. Max in the eye this time. Run guard. Will he pitch it or keep it? He'll keep it and he'll be tackled across the way by number 49 of the Alcorn State Braves. And Evan Doss, who is seeing his first action in several weeks. Brings down the quarterback run guard. Loss of two on the play. It's third down and nine. Interesting play for Youngstown State. They like the option. Run guard's an excellent option quarterback, and it makes it a very difficult offense and defense because they have play action effectively, great running attack, but they have that third element, the option. So the first passing down, if you will, of the day for run guard. Pat the only setback behind him. Run guard looking right all the way and in and out of the hands of Don Swistler, who appeared to, to have that ball thrown slightly behind him. Calvin Robinson on the coverage. That ball was thrown early. I like what run guard does here. Drop back pass. It's about a 12 yard out for the first. The ball was thrown before he even made his cut. That is a catch Swistler usually makes. So now the Youngstown State Penguins will be back to punt. Tim Drislinski, number 37, the punter. And back in single safety is Singleton. Percy Singleton at the 33. He's going to die, and down he goes at the 39. That's where Steve McNair, the Alcorn State Braves, will put it into play when we return. A 44-yard repunt, six-yard return back to Youngstown in a moment. For the Division One AA playoffs underway on ESPN, and happy Thanksgiving weekend to you and yours. Uh, Mike, let's have some pumpkin pie and uh, having a turkey yesterday. Apple pie for me, please. All right, here from Philadelphia, I can come have an apple pie, man. Okay, all towards safe, looking to get some offense generated. But there, one out of four in the day, nine yards, and he's fumbled once and been hit twice in the pocket. There he goes long down the center of the field, and almost intercepted. Almost intercepted by Reginald Lee. Reggie Brown also on the coverage hit Kobe Jenkins, the intended receiver. This is exactly the coverage I've been talking about the whole game. Reggie Lee, the inside linebacker, is going to hit Timmy McNair and then run underneath him, forcing him to elevate the football, and they almost make the interception. Reggie Brown coming in over top. Reggie Brown and Reginald Lee combining that time to make life miserable for Kobe Jenkins, second and ten. And this guy's a character. He's really the spiritual leader of that defense. He flies around and makes plays. Second and ten for McNair and company. Wide open this time is Gerald Harness. He's got a first down. He's out of bounds to the Youngstown 45. And that may be a key pattern for McNair. That's a good point, Tom. What they need to do now is understand that Youngstown's really putting the coverage to the trip side of the field. They've got to come back underneath to the back out of the backfield, that's Harness. And Leon Jones helping to drive him out about 16-yard gain. 
exactly what Alcorn needs to do here is take what the defense allows you and you get a good look at the, at the secondary after this play you'll see they really go front side heavy well they used that pattern quite a bit in the second half last week against Jackson State after McNair's hamstring gave him trouble McNair has his man that is Colby Jenkins who's driven back by Leon Jones but not until he gets inside the 40 to the 39 yard line well, what did we just talk about? Taking what the defense gives you. You can see he's going underneath two times in a row there, and that's what they're going to have to do. Youngstown will not allow them to beat him 20 yards and further down the field. You've got to take it underneath. It is second down and three. McNair now, three for seven, 32 yards on the day. Tim McNair in the slot to the left. Quick pattern out to the right to Donald Ross, and Ross does he stay in bounds? We'll have to await the official's mark. I believe it's enough for the first down. Ross had three touchdown catches last Saturday night in Jackson against Jackson State. Keep in mind what's happening here. They're in a two-deep coverage. Nickel with the linebackers rotating out to his own, looking with blitz coverage up front. So what he's going to see all day is a two-deep look with either zone or man underneath. McNair has all coin State on the Youngstown State 27. First down and 10. 7-0, Youngstown. McNair quickly again, and he's going to hit that pattern until they cover it. Donald Ross got some room, and he's out of bounds deep in Youngstown territory. Lester Weaver drove him out. Maybe inside the 10-yard line, have to wait. We have a tough uh, vantage point here. We're rather low to the ground from our vantage point. <laughs> so we don't have the... Here it is. It's a 14-yard pickup. Take what they'll give you. Get the ball out there quickly to your wide receiver, Ross. You bust the tackle and pick up another first down. So it's first and 10 for all going down at the 13-yard line. Crosswind from McNair's right to his left. Lots of time going for six points and not coming close to Tim McNair. In the area was Vance Mays. When they're in the red zone, Steve McNair is usually looking for one guy, brother Timmy. He's the inside yep. receiver of Trip. He's standing in the pocket. He's looking for his brother who pulled it up. And Vance Mays is really the closest guy to the area. You know what will be interesting here, Mike? If he has some time and his receivers are covered to see if Steve McNair does test that leg and take off. Well, so far, Tom, you've had him all season, but so far he hasn't even done it once today. No. He would do it at any time from any place if he was 100%. Quickly going to the air. Kobe Jenkins has it. Kobe Jenkins near the goal line. And it's a touchdown. McNair to Jenkins. And Alcorn State is on the board. Great recognition both by McNair and by Jenkins. It was a free safety blitz leaving Jenkins in 101 coverage. Number two, Lester Weaver comes right up the chute. 101 coverage. You get it out to your release receiver right there, Jenkins. And he's going to take it into the end zone. Great job. David Giacana on to attempt the extra point. Number eight, David Middleton, rather, Percy Singleton will be the holder. Rather, Vincent Thompson, the holder. Pardon me. Snap was less than perfect, but the kick is good through the uprights. And so with 8.26 to go in the first quarter, Alcorn State has uh, come back to tie this one up at seven apiece. And McNair did his job that time. Sure did, and I like what the Alcorn State offensive coordinators and staff did on that series. They adjusted exactly to what Youngstown State did defensively, which is that soft zone, giving them the underneath route. They took the route all the way down the field and popped it in the end zone. Great core of receivers for Steve McNair. I mean, it's not only him. You'll take a look there. Kobe Jenkins on the bench. His brother, Tim McNair, Donald Ross. Marcus Hinton has been bothered by a, by a calf injury most of the season. Excellent group of receivers. Well, what happened is Kobe Jenkins really stepped it up. He's only a sophomore, and when Hinton went down, that was a big injury to these guys. And Jenkins stepped it up, 70 catches, along with his brother, Timmy McNair, two guys over 70 catches. And the most interesting haircut on the team. 61-yard <laughs> drive, seven plays, a buck 25, minute 25 used off the clock. I think that would look great on you, Mike. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot left to talk about, <laughs> so anything would look good you, up there. You, you... All right, back to receive for the uh, Youngstown State Penguins. There's the kickoff man for Alcorn, number 16, Castro. And back to uh, receive is Randy Smith and Sean Patton. Randy Smith is the guy they want to handle. He's number one in Division One AA, averaging over 37 yards to kickoff return. Kickoff is end over end, and it's short. 
and it's picked off by one of the up men over the 30 the 35 the 40 yard line that is Max Gilchrist the starting Number fullback 20, and good field position for Youngstown in the 7-7 game let's go to Chris Fowler Okay, Tom, our two 1A college football games are now at halftime. Virginia, after trailing 7-6, gets a touchdown on a quarterback sneak from Mike Groh, leads NC State in the battle of two teams that are 5-2 and two in the ACC. Texas Tech, after falling behind 7-10, gets a touchdown. Lethbridge has been sacked three times. They still trail TCU by a field goal. Tom? All right, thank you very much, Chris. First and 10 for the Penguins of Youngstown State on their own 41-yard line. Good ball game here. One double-A playoffs if you're just tuning in. All court and Youngstown tied at seven. Mark Brungard is third offensive series of the day. Brungard pitches out to Sean Patton, who is nailed behind the line of scrimmage by Marcus Colley. Great play by Colley, but what set it up was the penetration by outside linebacker Jermaine Brown, number 48. He forced an early pitch. Watch Brown's reaction here. 48 slips right through the hole created by the pulling tackle, and that pushes the pitch out early and allowed the tackle to be made. Loss of two, it'll be second out of 12. You know, Youngstown State was very impressed with their first series with power football. If I were that much stick yet, it doesn't look like they're going to outquick Alcorn today. Now, Alcorn was trying to run through holes created by the pulling guard and tackle. After the long setback behind Rundgarn on second and 12. But guard looks for a pack in the flat, has his man up at the 45 where he steps out. Game of about seven, I believe. Just to finish your point, Tom, it, it really is a classic battle between the size of the Youngstown State offensive line versus what you see is the quickness of the linebackers and defensive line. Now, here's the big guy in the defensive line for Alcorn. That's Bryant Mix, number 50. Look at the hold. The only way he was kept out by Matt DeVicchio, excuse me, by Paul Coco, was a hold that was not called. Two wide receivers down low, two up at the top. So, an Alcorn-type look for Brungard at Youngstown. Pat Malone setback. They're down at seven. Has his man, Trent Boykin. He's wide open in the secondary down at the Alcorn 30. Dante Dowers brought him down after 26 yards. Great read by Brungard, the quarterback. He was looking for Zwizzler inside. Zwizzler wasn't open. He waited for Boykin to come in behind. First look is Zwizzler. It's not there. Hold on the ball. Now you come back on the deep in route to Boykin. And Boykin's only 5'5", 152. But boy, is this kid exciting. So Trent Boykin. Picks up the first down from nearby Kent, Ohio. He splits out to the bottom of the screen. Backs in the eye. Sean Patton on again. Sean Patton is tackled by Colley, but he picks up significant yardage to about the 23. Just pure power football. They want to line that line up in their big fullback, Dan Inglis, and that's an isolation block on the linebacker and give the ball the tailback right in behind. Good block by the fullback, Inglis. Opens up a hole. And Patton does a nice job twisting and turning and picking up about eight yards. It'll be second down and just over two. 640 and counting left here in the first quarter from Youngstown. Front guard to Patton again. Leaping, trying for that first down. And again, from our vantage point, it's tough to tell. We got it. Penalty flag is um, extracurricular activity after the tackle. Could be both sides. I'm not sure how they're going to call this. We didn't see uh, what precipitated that. Dante Dowers is upset for all Corn State. You know what? If you play defense in a game like this, you're upset from the beginning. I think these guys have been all upset all week, Tom, and justifiably so. Youngstown played last Saturday on the road against Indiana State. Alcorn played up in Jackson last Saturday night against Jackson State. Personal foul, Alcorn, and this is really going to hurt. Very end, very end of the play, Dowers comes in I got right there. Oh, well. Now, I, I don't know if he got pushed in or not, because yeah. it sure didn't look like a ballet, a ballet move there on top. I think he got pushed. Whatever. They push the ball, Mike, down to the 11-yard uh, line, just outside the 10. Youngstown could get a first down without scoring. But it'll be tough. They're going double tight end, eye formation. This is a power look. And the fullback is English, number 49, behind one guard. It is the tailback, Pat. 
squirming and finally brought down to the turf. Jermaine Brown is the primary tackler for Alcorn State. Good hit inside. The fullback is the lead guy, Inglis. Makes a nice block on the linebacker right there, number 48, Jermaine Brown. And that opens up the hole. They pick up about three or four yards. They're marking it just outside the six-yard line near the seven. So it's all second and seven. Boykin split out wide, and I do mean wide right, out of your picture frame. Our formation again. Give us to the tailback, Sean Patton, touchdown! Seven yards for Patton, his 10th touchdown of the season, couldn't have picked a better time. Now, there's, what they're doing is they're showing all for a variety of formations, double tight, two wide. This is the stretch play, left side of the line, Coco to DeVizio, and you just let Sean Patton pick his hole. Good play. 13 to 7 and on to attempt the extra point is Paul Masoro. <laughs> I think Sean Patton's got to learn to run through the end zone and not stop one yard deep. Yeah, Dante Dowers was even more upset that time. Masoro's kick is out there and it is good. Five minutes, 18 seconds still to play in the first quarter. Here from Youngstown State, the Penguins have established a touchdown lead over all courts. To Stanbaugh Stadium in Youngstown, Ohio. Mike Mayock, I'm Tom Mees. Youngstown and Alcorn State, the Division one AA pay playoffs, and a big payoff for Sean Patton that last year. Kid has not to play football for three years. Played on the national championship team back in 90. This is his first action. He dropped out of school, got his grades back to where they are, became an 1,100 yard rusher this year. And a short kickoff, and I do mean short, it'll trickle out of bounds at the 38 yard line. My goodness, getting his hands on him momentarily was Patrell Shelby, but Dorna, who was brought in to solve the kickoff problems, flunked that test. He, he kicked the tee further than he kicked the football. Let's see if we can get it here. Watch the tee go flying. A little low there, big guy. Oops. <laughs> and you know, Patrell Shelby, was the, he was the last guy that expected to touch that football. <laughs> He's trying to figure out who he's supposed to block there, and the ball came end over end to him. Well, it all washes out to pretty good field position for McNair and the Braves of the 38. They took it to 69 yards the last time they had their hands on it. Let's see if they continue to be patient, work the ball underneath like they need to. This is not the kind of day, Mike, I think it would lend itself to long bombs. You've got to whittle away, whittle away, and take what you can get. And McNair is calling the play from the line of scrimmage. Trips to the top of the screen, but he's going down low to Donald Ross, who's hit immediately, but hangs on. Vance Mays, the tackle. Ross picks up yardage to the 45. He's about just about four yards short of the first down. Picked up six, seven yards there on the quick hitch route. What's happening is he's calling the plays at the line of scrimmage, and then you can watch his leg come up. That's the silent count with a shotgun. When that leg comes up, he's telling his center, anytime you want to get it back to me, I'm ready. Second down and four for Alcorn at the 45. There goes the leg. Now it's up to the center. Looking right all the way, Kobe Jenkins. First down, I believe, at the 50-yard line if they give him forward progress. Reggie Brown brought him down, the senior out of Cleveland, Ohio. We're seeing a, a different Steve McNair today. Without the mobility that he usually has, he's realized what's happening with this deep zone, and he's saying, okay, we're going to take advantage underneath. There it is, trips. Kobe, the inside guy, excuse me, the middle guy just hooks up, first down. One, Mark football. Guy. One thing McNair did not lose last week, Mike, his arm straight. For his intelligence. That's right. Trips to the bottom again. First and ten. As his man wide open, Jerome Harness inside the 40 to the 38-yard line. McNair has now hit eight of his last nine passes. That went good for 12 yards and a first down. Hey, after a rocky start, let's not forget, he didn't take a snap in practice all week. And I don't care how good you are or how experienced you are, that will affect you early in a football game. Lost Jenkins and Tim McNair split to the left. Marcus Hinton, big play receiver, is top of the screen, number one. Remember that name. He doesn't catch many, but when they do, they usually go a long way. All the way to the left. McNair over the head of Jenkins, almost intercepted. Nice try there by Youngstown State's Randy Smith. You mentioned Marcus Hinton, and one of the things that they're going to do with him as the game goes on, you see McNair in the shotgun. He's looking to the trip side all the way here. No doubt where he's going with the football. The ball is just a little bit overthrown. 
But what you're going to see with Hinton on the short side is they've got extremely okay, short baby, defensive playing, backs, 5'6 and 5'11 on the corner. So they'll try and isolate Hinton on a jump ball situation because he's 6'6. There you see the play selection. No surprise. Heavily weighted in favor of the forward pass for Alcorn State. Second out of 10. Close the time for McNair. Look at this, you could have a coffee sandwich and dessert. Tim McNair is open to the 20 down of the 15-yard line. Chris Jones, the tackle, but no matter what quarterback, on what level, you give him that kind of time, you're in trouble. You notice, though, the mobility, once again, on that 22-yard gain is not there. The linebackers are lined up at seven to eight yards deep. That's unheard of for Youngstown State. They're usually at about three yards. Sooner or later, though, if you give this guy enough time, brother to brother, 22 yards. Ball is down on the 15-yard line, first and 10. Steve McNair to his brother. That's right, Tim McNair. They're both seniors in eligibility, and they will both matriculate after this year. One to a bit higher plane than the other, I have a McNair going for the end zone, intercepted. Picked off by Leon Jones, and he is going places. He might go. Donald Ross is the only guy that can get it. Touchdown. I'm not, I think Andre Jethro got it. I'm not sure, but Leon Jones takes it at the six-yard line, goes 94 yards. This guy is one of only two Butkus Award nominees in Division I AA around the whole country. There's a flag down. Well, I think it's... we're going to have excessive celebration. Yes, that's what it is, yep. And that's one of those rules that, frankly, they could throw out in most cases in my book. Now, I think there's a distinction to be made. If, if you're putting the ball in the face of the opponent, it's one thing. If you're taunting. Number 25, Paul Mastrano got the extra point. But if what you're doing is merely celebrating a great football play, I don't like the I got a dead ball life. foul. Unsportsmanlike conduct. Celebration by the scoring team. Touchdown is good. Mark off the penalty on the kickoff. Hey, I don't blame the official. He's told to call that. You can't blame him. But if you're Leon Jones and you ramble 94 yards at six foot two twenty-two and you score a touchdown in a playoff game, you deserve to be able to celebrate. And as long as you don't stick it in the other guy's face, let him celebrate. He's a college kid. I agree. There's a distinction to be made between flagrantly flaunting it in the face of the opponent and just celebrating because you made a heck of a play. Masaro's extra point will come momentarily. Kick is up, and the kick is good. So Youngstown State has turned two Alcorn State turnovers into quick touchdowns this afternoon, and they have a two-touchdown advantage over the Braves, who are a bit shell-shocked up here for Lorman, Mississippi. Alcorn State has been behind by a couple of touchdowns several times this year, but not against this caliber competition. Let's see if we can see who tips the football. Look at 40 right there. That's yep. what I thought. Andre Jethro, he's the nose guard. He was a high school linebacker, Jethro, and that's one of the things as we see this big guy ramble that Youngstown State's defense does. They're kind of ahead of their time. What they do is they've got two high school linebackers as a defensive lineman, and they got linebackers that run like defensive backs, so it's predicated on speed. Is that the Ron Jaworski in that penguin suit? <laughs> Jaws, if you're watching, we're thinking about you out here. Is that Jaws or is, the, is that Cliff Stout? Could be Cliff Stout. Well, it, Cliff spent a lot of time on the sidelines in his career. That could be stuff. Terry, Terry Bradshaw's caddy. That's right. Well, McNair has got it all right in front of him now. Down by two touchdowns. Yeah, it's still the first quarter. And I don't think you're going to see him get too extravagant. But you want to stop the bleeding here, or else it could be lights out early. Well, Sunday night NFL on ESPN. Drew Bledsoe and the New England Patriots against Marshall Falk and the Indianapolis Colts. Be honest now. Seven, eight weeks to go. Did you think this game would be a big game? <laughs> but it is for both teams as they're fighting for the playoffs in the AFC, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific time, right here on ESPN. Well, I think you knew Bill Parcells was going to get it done in New England, especially with a talent like Bledsoe. And I just get a kick out of watching Mar Marshall Fouts play. Well, now, wait a minute. I know the country took a turn to the right in the recent elections, <laughs> but that's ridiculous. Chris Berman for president? He's too tall to be president. <laughs> Among other things. <laughs> <laughs> 
Dorna, remember the penalty for the celebration. He'll take it off from the 20. This will give Alcorn great field position. If they can hang on to it, Singleton does. And he's tackled almost to be the end of the 46-yard line. So Alcorn State, the bad news is they're down by two touchdowns. The good news is that, again, they'll have excellent field position. But let's think how big a play that was on the interception because Alcorn was driving and at least a field goal. So that's a minimum 10-point turnaround just on the interception and the turnover. Now, McNair, of course, he has to keep his confidence level up. Mike, he was rolling. He had hit, what, eight out of nine, was looking good, uh, second series in a row. I don't think this kid's going to lose a confidence level. From the case I see, he's at his most dangerous when he's behind by two touchdowns or more. Then they really open it up. Just ask the Southern University of New York. Detroit State. That's right. Probably watching today. So it's very likely he's going to make the game of Madison tomorrow. McNair up to the flat. Overthrows Donald Ross. Overthrows Ross, it'll be second and ten. You know, the more I watch Steve McNair, the more I think that hamstring bothered me. Watch the mobility. He hardly moves at all in the drop back. Here's the zone defense, the soft zone, sitting back. He threw that ball off his back foot. And that's not like Steve McNair. That means the ham's bothering him. He can throw it well off his back foot. I've seen him do that lots of times, but that's uh, not the way he would, would like to do it. really attempted to run in this game. Oh, his, his left leg is really bothering. You can see it on the drop back. Completes it to Marcus Hinton inside the 45 to the 43. That should be a first down. Vance Mays with a tackle. Now that looked a little bit more like Steve McNair, but he still is not pushing off that back foot and, and throwing it as hard as you watch him. He's going to go back three or four yards. He'll bounce around in the pocket a little bit, but he just does It's more of an arm action than it is a lower body. Yep. And he's a classic drop back pass. He's a great arm. We're not seeing Steve McNair today. First and 10 on that completion to Hinton. Ball at the 42 of Youngstown. Off the hands, it back into the hands of Jerome Harness. Good concentration as Reginald Lee hit him a ton. But Harness out of the backfield made the catch. At about the 36-yard line. Yeah, I'm not saying that Steve McNair can't get the job done today. I mean, Steve McNair at 75% is much better than most of the quarterbacks in the country. Yeah. But I just don't think we're seeing vintage McNair because of the hamstring. No, there's no doubt. When I saw him leave the field on that play against Jackson State last Saturday, you knew it was a hamstring, and you knew with five days to get ready, there was no way it could really be 100%. Second down and five. Under a bit of a rush this time, and hurries it to harness. Reginald Lee was right there. It'll be third down and five. Reggie Lee's really a good football player. Inside linebacker, he's got the speed of a strong safety. He couldn't wait for this football game today because he, he can stop the run. He also does well getting under the pass. Situation right here. He's going to stay in the pocket. Great arm strength. He really delivers that. Reginald Lee, a 6'4", senior out of Miami, Florida. Has one of the 19 pass interceptions for Youngstown coming into this game today. Out of the backfield, Harness again, first down, Jerome Harness, big yardage, Vance Mays bumps him out of bounds, inside the 25-yard line. Taking what the defense will give you, they turn the corner around, but Vance Mays got run off deep, and then they threw the ball back underneath him. Strictly his own coverage, they turn the corner around, Reggie Lee doesn't get there quickly enough, and he moved the chain. With Steve McNair and Alcorn, in a game on television, you better get some extra snacks because uh, it's going to be a long afternoon. They almost exclusively passed the ball. Last week's game took over four hours. Later. It's not good to hear when i got to get to the airport. <laughs> McNair has to do some running now. He's under a heap of trouble. Gets out of it and just throws it away. And after he throws it, he's hit well after the pass. The hit came down, and the all-corn sidelines wants a penalty, but they're not going to get it. Good catch down there by the big fella in the black and gold there. Steeler fan, obviously. Is that a, is that a pit? No, it's a pit Steeler fan. You know, you're in dangerous territory. That's right. You're halfway, yeah. right? Are you a Brown fan or are you a Steelers fan? I'm neither. Second down and ten. I'm safe. Ball at the Youngstown 22, and a timeout has been called. By whom? Youngstown. Youngstown State has called a timeout to talk it over. One minute, 47 seconds left to go here in the first quarter. And you might be saying at home, okay, 
what is this Heisman Trophy candidate all about, this McNair guy? How's he doing? Well, not bad coming into today. I mean, that, that's a joke. That 14, that, well, he, he, he's over 2,000 yards ahead of uh, where Ty Detmer was, the former record holder. More yards than anybody in NCAA history. Passing, running the football, passing yardage, rushing yardage in his career, almost 1,000 of those coming this season. The numbers are mind-boggling. The ones I like for this year, though, are he's got 44 touchdown passes against only 17 interceptions. And when you throw the football 530 times in a season and only give it up 17 times, that tells me he understands the passing game. I don't think he would stop ahead Leon Jones, though. 94 yards the other way. Well, that wasn't his, his fault. That's a tip pass. Yep. Once the ball's tipped, the quarterback obviously has no control. The telling thing on that play was if Steve McNair has a healthy hamstring, Steve McNair makes that tackle. And he was nowhere to be found chasing Leon Jones. That's right. That's right. Well, McNair will gather his thoughts. The winner of this game today and the way the brackets are for the NCAA Division I AA playoffs will play the winner of tomorrow's game between Eastern Kentucky and Boston University. And uh, those are two traditional powers because New England is proud because they have both BU and New Hampshire out of the Yankee Conference in the playoffs. Second down. And you talk about Eastern Kentucky, and they had four consecutive championship games between 79 and 81. To put it in historical perspective, really, Georgia Southern and Eastern Kentucky are the only other schools in one double A that have the same heritage as Youngstown State. Does. Penguin fans urging their defense on. Second down and 10 for Alcorn at the Youngstown 22. Youngstown leads it 21 to 7. McNair to the sideline. That pattern's been good to him. He hits Gory White. Gets away from one or two tacklers and is out deep in Youngstown territory. Lester Weaver knocked him out of bounds. Gory White is a special football player. This kid can really run. He runs a 4-4-40. He was the SWAC Rookie of the Year last year on special teams with punt returns and kickoff returns. And for them to win the football game, they got to get the ball in his hands in the open field and let him make people miss. It's first to go all corn at the Youngstown 8-yard line. White's only uh, negative point is he fumbles regularly. Right. Yep. Well, that's why he doesn't see as much action as he should. Long count for McNair. Looking end zone all the way. Now he's going to take off and throw and just can't hit Donald Ross in the end zone. Lester Weaver on the coverage. I think it's obvious from this play right here that he does not have the mobility we've seen before. This would be a situation where he'd hit, he'd hit the corner hard and put pressure on the defense. Because he's not able to, they're able to sit back there in that zone. Look at him. Usually he'd take off and put a heck of a lot more pressure on the defensive backfield. He doesn't Second have the ability to do that today. Second down and goal for the eight. Alcorn needs to come away with some points on this drive, I would think. Even though it's still the first quarter. McNair stepping up. Now stepping down to the curve. He is sacked. Mike McLeod got him and brought him down. It'll be third and goal. Mike McLeod. Youngstown ran a little twist in the defensive line. A little jailbreak back there. What happens with Jethro ran around Khan, put some heat on from the backside, flushed him out, and the tackle's made inside. And McNair by Mike McLeod. Getting up limping. He's basically playing on about one and a half good legs out there. Loss of six, third, third and goal from the 14. Goal kid that made that play just came off two years of minor league baseball, Mike McLeod. They're down and goal. A little more room to work with if you're a wide receiver, even though they lost on the play. Double clutching is McNair. He has his man. Touchdown! Tim McNair wide McNair open. Back of the end zone. Great job by Steve McNair. He waited and waited and waited. The safety separated. He knew the middle of the field was wide open. He just needed a break between the linebackers. And when he got it, he delivered the football. Drops back. Wait for it to clear. Wait for it to clear. Wait for it to clear. Now he delivers it. Wide open to his brother. Touchdown. You wonder how Tim McNair got so wide open. That's what happens when you have so much time. You can't cover everybody. Jakana. Again, the snap less than perfect. The kick is up, and the kick is good, though, with 36 seconds left in the first quarter. You like points? We got points. 21 to 14. Let's give Alcorn State and Steve McNair some credit here. Big play goes against them. Big turnaround on the interception. They go right back down the field, and we've got a seven-point game again. And how open was Tim McNair? Well, let me see. Let's follow Good it. Good ISO. 
safeties separate. The middle of the field's open. The linebackers can only get so deep. He's in between Leon Jones and Reggie Lee. When Lee separates right there, it's a touchdown. All right, college football action all afternoon on ESPN. College basketball action tonight from Springfield, Massachusetts, home of the Basketball Hall of Fame. That's a Hall of Fame matchup. Number one preseason Arkansas taking on number three preseason Massachusetts Minutemen from the Springfield Civic Center, followed by the championship of the preseason NIT from Madison Square Garden in New York at 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific. That'll be Ohio University's Bobcats, I believe, against New Mexico State. And they are attending to Steve McNair between every offensive series, and that's a good idea. And they've got heat on underneath. He's got a pad on. Heat is trying to keep that thing as loose as they possibly can. And if he can't loosen up that ham any more than it is, we're just not going to see a very mobile Steve McNair today. All right, so Alcorn State has cut that lead from two touchdowns to one. And the Braves kick off. And it's taken by number eight of Youngstown State. Over the 30 to the 37 near the 40-yard line. That is Randy Smith that he's brought down. Let's check in now with Chris Fowler. Tom updates from 1A. After Texas Tech had taken the lead, driving the length of the field with a second-half kickoff, back come the Horned Frogs. Max Naki to Jimmy Oliver for the second connection on the afternoon. 16-14 Horned Frogs. Virginia. Already leading NC State, pressures Terry Harvey, picked off by Randy Neal, the Cavs' 26th interception of the season, the most in one act. All right, Chris, thank you very much. Randy Smith returned that kickoff by Alcorn State. Shannon Williams returned it up to the 43-yard line. You take a look at McNair's numbers as he'll take a pause and hope that his defense can hold Youngstown State. Sean Patton on the carry. Jermaine Brown the tackle after a short game. Jermaine Brown's a big time player. He had 106 tackles and two sacks Tackled this year. And he's one of the best players Jermaine on this Alcorn Brown. State defense. Time winding down as you see in the first quarter. It's been an entertaining first quarter play. We've had an interception run back for a touchdown. We've had a fumble and a touchdown the first three plays of the game by Youngstown State. And now we have the end of the first quarter. The Penguin fans are cheering, but I have a feeling they know they're in for a football game this afternoon. After one quarter from Stambaugh Stadium in Youngstown, the playoffs have begun. And Youngstown leads this one 21-14. Palace here at Youngstown, Stambaugh Stadium, home of the two-time defending national champions of Division I AA. They won it in 1991. They won it again in 93, and they have yet to taste defeat here in 94. The Penguins of Youngstown State 10-0-1, and their quarterback, the junior Mark Brungard, leads them out. First and 10 to open this drive from their own 45-yard line. John Patton the carry. And he's tackled for little, if any, game. Sidney Middleton of Alcorn, the first to hit him. And this kid, Brungard, we talk, spent a lot of time talking about Steve McNair, but the kid on the other team, Brungard, only a junior, he's already got a national championship ring he wears. He was a starter last year. What the coaches tell me about this kid is, number one, he makes great decisions. Number two, he avoids turnovers at all costs. And lastly, he gets him out of bad calls at the line of scrimmage. Well, Brungard, junior out of the Middletown, Ohio. 13 touchdowns, only six INTs this season. Faces a third down and eight. He's changing the call right now. We talked about getting out of bad calls from the sideline. He just did. Crowd's very quiet with Youngstown has the ball. One front guard and his receiver to Harry. He hits the tight end, Berlinski, who rumbles into Alcorn territory. Calvin Robinson brought him down. Perfect timing by Mr. Brungard, who just talked about the decisions he makes at the line of scrimmage. He reads blitz coverage. What does he do? He sits, splits the back, three step drops, bang to the tight end over the middle, Terleski, and it's a first down, 17 yard game. It's one way to get out of the third and eight pickle. Picked the right, uh, right audible there, didn't it? <laughs> he knew he had the middle of the field open, and that was his hot receiver right there, Terleski. Darnell Bracey goes wide to the top of the screen. Trent Boykin goes wide to the left of the slot man is Don Swistler in first and ten. The all point 38. One guard, little screen to Patton. He's got the roll. John Patton alerts to Patler. Down the sideline he goes. Alan Tate Bell made the tackle and may have saved the touchdown. Well conceived play. They had the tight end and both wide receivers to the wide side, ran the ball down the field, and then came back on the screen the other way to Patton. 
really well done. Reverse angle here, coming right in your face. Good look at Sean Patton. He's got the offensive lineman in front of him. Good block there by Ray Miller, the big 308-pound guard, and Sean Patton does the rest. Run guard to Patton. Gets it down to the 14-yard line of Alcorn State, first and 10 there. They give to the tailback who started the game, Hendricks, and a flag 32. on the play. Nicky Hendricks is tackle. A flag will have that in a moment. Let's check in with Chris Fowler. Tom, the scoring fast and furious in all divisions. Down 20-7 to 7 in, in uh, Charlottesville. The Wolf Pack reports some trickery here. Carlos King, Mike Guffey, it's 1914. Nine and a half to play in the third. Don? All right, those longtime ACC rivals going at it on this Friday afternoon. Let's get the penalty. Holding on the offense. Repeat the down. Hendricks was tackled, but there was some holding going on, and it'll be first down and slightly longer yardage. They'll march it off 10 yards. Well, this is what power football is all about. They get the I formation. The 49, the fullback, is going to be blocking on the outside linebacker, Colley. Look at the collision at the point of attack right there. Colley, 37, is only 175 pounds. 10-yard penalty for the spot of the foul. Puts it back at the all-court 22. Or it's first and 18 and front guard. Good play. Thanks to Whitler. And he's in the end zone. Touchdown. Number 12, what an effort by front guard. John Whitler for the YSU touchdown. Good play fake by Brungard and an excellent pass to Whistler for the touchdown. Once again, it's recognition. They recognize the blitz coverage. They ran the post corner route, picked up the blitz. It was all man to man at this point. Play action. Whistler's going to run the corner out at the top of your screen. He gets the separation from Eliante Bell, and it's a touchdown. So Massaro is on to attempt his fourth extra point of the afternoon. Kick is up and good. And with 12.49 to go in the first half, Don Twistler sits down. He's caught a touchdown pass. And that man's team, the Youngstown State Penguins, lead it by two touchdowns. Hey, Bollies fans, pull up a chair and sit down. Because you don't... Until Stambaugh Stadium here in Youngstown, Ohio. Early second quarter, Division I AA National Playoff game. Mike Mayock, I'm Tom Mees. The Penguins lead it 28 to 14. And a game that has featured several big plays already. Richard Singleton receiving the kickoff with John Jordan. Singleton for Alcorn State over the 30-yard line. Back out at about the 32 before the whistles blow. And that's where Steve McGarry and Kevin will have it first and 10. Front guard very efficient today for Youngstown. Five out of six, 94 yards, and that touchdown. See, it took six plays in just under three minutes to complete. One of the more efficient drives you'll see from a club like Youngstown State. Used to plotting, they're not used to those big post corner routes for touchdowns. Well, a lot of people felt if this game was a track meet, it would favor Alcorn State. We've seen a lot of scoring in Youngstown State with a two-touchdown lead. Are you surprised, Mike? Uh, a little bit, but let's face it, some of those scores off turnover. So it's a little different kind of ball game. Three wide receivers to the top of the screen for McNair and Alcorn State. And he goes the other way as he has so often. Jerome Harness. Over the 40-yard line of the 42 where Jones and Gilligan combine to bring him down close to first down yardage if he doesn't have it. Tom Tolucci, redshirt freshman, play in at the corner. He made the play that time. They're playing a two-deep zone. He's the coverage man underneath. Steve McNair taking what they'll give him. And they give him about nine yards and ten inches. <laughs> Second down and inch. I would say it's a great time for play action, but oh, look at this. First time today, he's under the center. Under the center yeah. Didn't expect we'd see that today, and uh, well, actually the second time. The other time was the other exactly. quarterback. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Did it tell you anything? Well, what it tells me is that they don't have any running backs to drive over the pile, right? <laughs> That's what it tells me. I guess it says if, if he's under center, it's the quarterback's knee. Yeah. Because they have nobody else <laughs> to, get, to get a couple of inches. Well, McNair is, is large. He's 6'2", 218. So actually would make perfect sense, even if you did have a, a big core of running backs, to go with the quarterback. In that so he'll pick up the first down. 
five and counting here in the first half. Lots of time for McNair this time. Over the middle he goes to brother Tim McNair. He's got first down yardage. Ramon Amelie made the tackle at the Youngstown 43 12-yard completion. That big offensive line is doing a nice job picking up the pace, and that's something McNair said they have to do. Look at the time he had. Sit, sit, move your feet a little bit, look for your brother. Timmy McNair wide open over the middle. I don't care how good your defensive backs are, if they have that much time to throw the ball, you're going to get beat. First and 10 for Alcorn on the Youngstown 44. the first rush has his man open at Donald Ross who is tripped up just outside the 35 yard line by Randy Smith the four man rush Chris Inglis broke loose and almost got Smith there but he still has enough mobility to step outside here goes Inglis hard inside there's the step outside the step inside Jethro and delivers the ball on time to Donald Ross pick up a six on the play second and four Later this afternoon, Georgia Tech in Georgia. That is 4 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN. McNair steps up a little bit now. Down the sideline, a bad decision intercepted. Oh, Tom, Tom Paolucci on the interception, and that was a bad decision by McNair. Sure was, and Paolucci, in for the first series of the game, has already been involved in two plays on this series. This play, Paolucci makes the interception. It looked like McNair was trying to throw into double coverage on the sideline. One of the few times he's gone away from the three wide receivers, he's looking back towards the single receiver who's double covered underneath. Actually, that's just a great bat play by Paolucci. He's the guy that tipped it, and he's the guy that caught it. Another turnover, and Youngstown State has taken two of them into the end zone this afternoon. They'll take over first and 10 at their own 18. Second interception of Steve McNair on the day. The tailback, Patton, he's head up with Brian Mix, and that means he doesn't go very far. Get him around two. Brian Mix is a little bit scary. I mean, he's 6'4", 275, and the coaches tell me that he runs a legitimate 4'6", 40. That is scary. There's McNair's totals on the day. Yes, he has two touchdown passes, but yes, two interceptions, one return for a touchdown. The first interception, not his fault. The second one, he tried to force. Second down. Well, he gives uh, the running back Patton the gain of only one. Second and nine. Boykin to the left, Whistler to the right. There goes Brungard down the line. This one and discretion the better part of Allen with Ben Carter running him out of bounds. That was a double tight end set with two wide receivers, which is a balanced set. There's no strength either way, and they come with down the line options. But like you said a little bit earlier, Tom, Grambling, excuse me, all four state speed up front, down linemen and linebackers is going to be very difficult to run options today. Yeah, they are big and they are fast. They pursue well. The Alcorn State defense has been much maligned throughout the year, but the one coach made a good point to me. He says, McNair takes so little time putting points to the board that his defense sees a lot of time out on the field. They get tired. Some way to look at it, I suppose. They're down at five. One guard steps up. Hits his man who may have been hit early. The ball is intercepted, but a flag in the play. We may have some pass interference. Marcus Colley ended up with a ball for but hold everything. Great hustle play by Marcus Colley to get to that football. Uh, let's see. Gonna go against all four. Mass interference against the defense. First down, young son. You can see that hit just a tad early. I'm not sure I like the call, though. The defensive player has an opportunity to go for the foot. Let's see if he's trying to get through the offensive man to the football or if it's just an early hit. Pass interference. Run guard's going to deliver this over the middle. Steps up. That left hand always is what kills you. Because you're dragging that left hand on the, the man's back, 
that was Bell with the left arm wrapped around. Whether or not it's a legitimate call, they will call that 99% of the time when you drape the arm. Ellen Tate Bell, he's a freshman from out by you, Mississippi, and Cardell Jones, we know his opinion of that call, but frankly, when I saw him with the naked eye, I thought, I think he got there just a bit early. And is Coach Jones calling a timeout? He is. With 9.32 left to go here in the first half. The officials are still talking. They don't see him. Now, Bell is an excellent cover oh. guy, only a freshman. He wants to talk to the official. I don't think he wants a team timeout. He wants to talk about it. Is this unusual? I think he wants to talk so badly he's willing to give up a timeout. Well, he, he's saying, oh, he says the ball was tipped before it got there, and therefore the receiver was fair game. The minute the ball tipped, that's exactly right. If the ball is tipped, all pass interference calls go out the window. It's a jump ball at that point. Well, the referee begs to differ, and we know who wins that argument. Yeah, I didn't see a tip there. No, I didn't either. So after some delay, we'll get things underway again. First and ten after the penalty. Does not diminish the effort of the play there by Marcus Colley, who used to be a strong safety because of injuries, is now an outside linebacker at 5'10", 175. Let's see if we can see a tip here. Steps up. Delivers the football. There's no tip. No, the no. tip has got to come from up in front somewhere. There's no tip there. Now they have adjusted the spot of that ball. Originally, they had it up around the 40-yard line. Now they moved it back to the 32 or 33-yard line. Where it'll be first and 10 there. Put it on the 33. Hey, right, right. Opening round, NCAA Division I AA College Football Playoffs. Defending national champion Youngstown, 10 on one Leading all Corn State, 28 to 14. At the tailback. Runs into Collie and Bryant Nix after picking up about three or four. You wonder why these guys want to run the football at Alcorn, and the answer is the two inside linebackers at this point, Tom. One of them is 5'10", 175, Marcus Collie. The other is a converted tailback, number 44, Harry Brown. So that's why they're trying to get after him. They have a huge size advantage inside. Second down at six for Brungard and the Penguins at the 37. Here's a give to Gilchrist. His first carry of the day, and Max Gilchrist is over the 45 to the 46. Calvin Robinson brings him down, but not until Gilchrist picked up the first down. Gilchrist doesn't get a whole lot of carries because he's predominantly a blocking back, which was you've got talk about Youngstown. They lost their starting tailback last play of the uh, preseason, and they lost their starting fullback four weeks ago, and they're still undefeated. Nice job by Gilchrist, primarily a blocker, but knows what to do with the football when he gets it. Gilchrist, 41 rushes uh, during the regular season for 155 yards, only one touchdown. Primarily used as a blocker, picked up the yardage there. First and 10 of the 45 for the Penguins. Patton picks up about three and a half for a host of Braves ball on him. Chief among them, Sidney Middleton. Second down from there. Let's check in again with Chris Fowler. Tom, NC State's furious rally at Virginia continues. Terry Harvey brought him back, and now Jeff Bender in the game as quarterback. Adrian Hill, his second touchdown reception. Once down, 19-7. It's now 24-19 pack. Well, North Carolina State, very resilient. They were beaten up physically and emotionally by Florida State a week ago. Something in the air today. High scoring ball game. Oh, oh, oh. At the tailback, 11 carries, 33 yards, three yard average, second down and five. Pat gets it again. And of a couple fumble on the play. All point State is recovered. Calvin Robinson picks it up. So the first turnover of the day for Youngstown State. I think Sean Benton outside linebacker made the hit there really a solid hit at the line of scrimmage and that's the kind of play all corn state needs to stay in this football game let's see if we see 54 bent step up and make the hit here just a isolation off tackle there's 54 bent brings the ball loose huge turnover leave it to eagle eye mayock to pick that one up boston college eagle eye oh thank you they play on words all right, so Alcorn State with a break now. After that fumble recovery, has a first and 10 on the young side, 48. There you see the turnover scoreboard on the day. Trips to the bottom of the screen for McNair. Pressure on, he's going long, he's got 10 McNair, and he is hit from behind. Art Carter with 
great coverage in the secondary. The somewhere the young South Bay has saved a touchdown. Timmy McNair almost got that on the way down, lying on the ground. Great individual effort here. This is the kind of play I expected to see to challenge the two-deep zone. When you play a two-deep zone, you've got to challenge the seams. The guy down the middle, two down the sideline. That's what this play is. He's going to put into the wind some air under the ball. Watch the second effort here. The ball could watch it. Hits him in the helmet, then on the back. Oh, he almost comes up with it. That was closer than it looked. I got excellent defense there by Carter to help knock it away. McNair under pressure gets rid of it. They're looking for a grounding penalty. They don't have it. Mike McLeod was there. The fans want intentional grounding, but the arm was coming forward. Good effort by McLeod, who's playing more and more as the season goes on. There goes the penalty flag. Oh, Steve McGarrett lost his cool. He said something to the referee, and it's going to cost him. And, oh, wait a minute. Now, that's an intentional well, ground call. Well, that's the one of the latest flags I've ever oh, yeah, seen. Yeah, that's, that's almost unbelievable. Why, if you're going to make that call, why wait that long? I mean, I see somebody making that call on the fly. I can understand it. I was looking for the penalty flag myself, but that's late. Well, he's wrapped up by McLeod when he throws the football. The question is, did he do it on purpose, or was he trying to get the ball down the field? I don't think you throw the flag there. Well, if you do or not, I'm not saying it's the wrong call. It's just very late. There's no question it's late. Yeah. I have intentional grounding on the offense. Lots of down. Third down. Darnell Jones doesn't agree. Of course, you wouldn't expect him to. But you make the good point. The distinction is it should never come down that late. If you're, no. if you're a referee in any sport, you make a demonstrative call when it happens. Don't leave yourself open to guys like you and I second guessing. But we'll do it. <laughs> well, that brings up a third and 20. We'll do it in a minute. Third and 22. Interesting to see if the Penguins put on a big rush on McNair here. It's like four men are coming. Great. The clown almost got him again. Down the right sideline. Tim McNair. And does he have it or not? No, incomplete. Another great effort. It'll bring up a punting situation. Art Carter again on the coverage. That's just a jump ball situation. Carter and Smith had McNair bracketed. I'm not sure why he's throwing that football in that situation. The score is 28-14. There's still a football game here. There's no need to force that. Chris Castro is back to punt. Trent Boykin will receive it. Let's take the same type of situation. He makes a couple people miss. Now he's going to throw it as far as he can throw it. The guy's bracketed. His brother is bracketed between Smith and Carter. Really no shot at that. And lucky, frankly, that it wasn't intercepted. Uh-oh, Castro is going to go down. Bad snap from center. No, they're not going to allow the return, but Jer Jermaine Hopkins brought him down, and that's where Youngstown will take over. Youngstown has blocked five kicks. They've deflected three more. They take more pride in their special teams than any college team I've ever seen in my life, and they're coming up big again, even though it's a bad step. That ball ought to be handled there. Look what? how quickly they get there. It was moving on Castro. Fairness to the young man, there is a crosswind. I think that ball moved. Uh, yeah, but he's still got to catch the football. But I'll tell you what, even if he handles it, I think Reggie Lee is there early enough to make the play. So, the turnover scoreboard goes once again in favor of Youngstown State as they'll pick that up and go first to 10 for the Alcorn 23. Let's see if they run the ball here conservatively, if they go play action and try and make a big play. I think one guard might go for the whole thing right here. Vaughn. There's Hendricks. Oh, maybe I'm right. He's down near the end zone. And out of bounds near the goal line. Nicky Hendricks, 18-yard gain. He's out at the five. Second time today they want to run the stretch play. The first one was a touchdown to Pat. The second one almost a touchdown to number 32, Nikia Hendricks. Nikia Hendricks, of course. Here's what happens on the stretch play. The key is to block by the fullback to seal the corner. You're, the tailback can choose down. any hole he wants. He kicks it correctly outside because of 49 English's seal block on the corner. Kia Hendricks, of course, started this game and plays with Sean Patton just on the first series, though. Picks up a big play there. 18 yards. The first and goal for Youngstown State. Knocking on the door again. Here goes Patton. Nice thing into the end zone. Touchdown. Mm -hmm. You know, 
if you play in an I formation offense, a two-back offense, and you're a fullback, you've got to know how to block people. And Dan English put that nice hit on outside backer Evan Doss, number 49, to make it easy for Sean Patton to dance into the end zone. Patton right there. Look at 49 in front of him. There's the kick-out block. Touchdown. Yeah, they got rid of uh, the pursuit right there. Jermaine Brown, number 48, I think was the victim of that great block. You steal to the inside, you kick out on the outside for Keith. Trying to attempt the extra point. Massaro is up and good. 654, a flag on the play. Flag on the play. We'll sort that out after our commercial break. 654 to go in the half. Youngstown is up big. Attempted the extra point. Not enough in on the line of scrimmage against Youngstown, so they had to march it back and attempt that extra point once again. And Paul Massaro came in and did his job from a little bit further out. Nope. Actually, a better snap and hold this time anyway, and he just sneaks it inside that right Ooh. pipe. So, Jim Tressel's team leading it now by a commanding march of 35 to 14. 6.54 to go in a half, and this is exactly the scenario no coach wants to fall behind, but when you have an effective but one-dimensional offense like Alcorn State, you really hate to fall behind, especially on the road. And while they get prepared to, to kick it off, that's something that's got to be going through the mind of uh, Cardell Jones. You yeah, hate to overemphasize the importance of a drive with 6.54 left in the second quarter, but Alcorn State needs to put the ball in the end zone and close the gap before halftime. Well, Massaro will attempt this kickoff. He's our second uh, man to handle the kickoffs today for Youngstown. John Dorma has been on for a few, and now Massaro will take his turn. Dorma had a different success. Singleton will take this at about the five-yard line. Percy Singleton. Tackle just over the 20. First and 10 there. Alcorn State down by three touchdowns now. And if you're Cardell Jones or if you're Steve McNair, how do you look at this situation now, Mike? Well, if you're Steve McNair, he's really limping. He comes back out on the field. I think it's getting worse instead of loosening up. He's struggling a lot today. That last series I thought was a bad series for Alcorn in general and Steve McNair in particular. He forced the ball a couple of times. He's lucky he didn't have those deep balls intercepted. Yeah, coming back, getting a, getting a turnover at midfield, and you're down by one touchdown. You think, you're okay, let's go. You're down by two touchdowns, let's go. And then all of a sudden, boom, down by three. First and 10 at the 22 for Alcorn. Sidelines, the mark is hitting. Short game, he's knocked down by Paolucci. Let's check in again with Chris Fowler. Back to that wild ball game in Charlottesville after 17 unanswered points for NC State. The Cavaliers strike back. Mike Grow to Patrick Jeffers, the final 52 yards of an 80-yard drive. They missed the two-pointer. They lead by one. Texas Tech has just missed a chip shot field goal with their backup kicker, Tony Rogers. They still trail in Fort Worth by two. Tom? Hey, Chris, uh, where's the defense in the ACC today? My goodness. Gain of five on that pass from McGarry to Hinton, second and five. McGarry has to avoid his own man, lofting it up, intercepted again, Lester Weaver. Down the sidelines and finally stopped around the 20-yard line by Michael Ellis. Third interception of McNair on the day, 28-yard return. Lester Weaver is the big play defensive player for Youngstown State. That's the 11th time this season he's been involved in a turnover. That's his sixth interception. He's got three fumble recoveries, and he's caused two fumbles. Steve McNair is not 100%, but let's face it, he's had a lot better days than this. One leg throws it over the head of the potential receiver, right into the hands of Lester Weaver. Tom, I should ask you, you've seen these guys play often this year. Yep. This isn't Steve McNair. No, no, no I'm not going to make alibis for the young men. They're up against heavy competition on the road. They're facing right now a team that is clearly a better football team. You wish as, uh, as someone who's interested in great competition that everybody was 100%, but it's not going to be that way for either team. And to give us to Matt Gilchrist on first down, picks up a couple. Rodney Parker in the area for Alcorn State. Harry Brown also on the tank. They were looking for some respect yesterday. Lester's saying, hey, you got to give it to us now. They made an interesting point when we spoke with them. They're not unused to seeing great quarterbacks. Last year in the playoffs, they had Doug Nussmeyer from Idaho. They shut him down. 160 yards. They won the game big. They're not in awe of Alcorn or Steve McNair. Sometimes that's half the battle. Second down and seven. Patton. Sean Patton. Look out. 
Is he in there? Not quite. They are just blowing these guys right off the line. That hole was so open that the guard, 78, Ray Miller, pulling in front, had nobody to block all the way through the hole. The guard turned it up. He could have run for a touchdown. Marcus. Watch 78 pull out in front. There he is right there. He's got nobody to block. He turns it up. Nobody to block. The guard is 12 yards down the field with no one to block. They are just absolutely annihilating this defense right now. First and goal at the two. And again. Scores again. Exact same play they ran the play before. 41 to 14. And Youngstown is beginning to blow this thing wide open early. This is what their kids told us yesterday. They thought they were bigger, stronger, and even quicker. And that they really felt like they had something to prove out here today. Well, they're proving it. They ought to all be lawyers. They're making a great case. We've got enough lawyers out there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> More than enough. Pizarro for the extra point. Flag on the play again. That's the second straight extra point where Youngstown has been flagged. Where well, there has been a flag on the play. Let's see who's again. Get another motion penalty, I believe. Offside against Alcorn. So the point will stand, you would think. Official. I've got offside on the defense. Extra point is good. Five yard penalty on the kickoff. Five yard penalty will be enforced on the kickoff. Sean Patton having a big day here at Youngstown, Ohio. 4.50 to go until halftime. And the Penguins are crushing Alcorn State 42 to 14. Fluttering here at Stambaugh Stadium, and the people are excited with good reason. A sellout crowd cheering on their Youngstown State Penguins, undefeated, defending national champs, looking every bit like it. Leading Alcorn State 42 to 14. Not on at all by Steve McNair, and Corey White says, I think we'll take this at the 20. He takes it in the end zone, and McNair limps back onto the field. His backup, a fellow by the name of Andre Credit, came on last week against Jackson State, but I wouldn't think he'd come on now. No. You know, the thing I don't understand, Tom, and, and late in the first quarter, we talked about how well this team had adapted to the defense they were facing. And McNair took the short passes, mm -hmm. they moved the ball down the field, they scored a couple times, yet the last couple of series, it's almost been a panic situation, trying to force the ball down the field into coverage. Bad idea. Against the defense, the caliber of Youngstown State. Well... McNair did not run out of the field. He walked gingerly. He is far from 100% in this quarter, though. Only four of eight. No touchdowns, two interceptions. Goes to the sideline. Colby Jenkins has it up near the 30-yard line. Taken to the ground by Randy Smith. The good tackle there by Randy Smith. Smith's only 5'6", 175. But let's see if we take a look at how deep this secondary is playing. It's a two-deep zone. Nickel package in the game. They're 20 yards off at the snap of the ball. You've got to take what's in front, force the guy to come up and make a one-on-one -on -one tackle. That's the only shot Alcorn has, Alcorn has today to move the football. Well, you're going to play that, that softer defense, too. When you're up 42 to 14, you can afford to do it. But they've been playing it all game. Is there consistent? Look at this, a straight give to the running back. First time we've seen that today. <laughs> and the mock cheer goes up from the Youngstown State crowd. Well, they love their Penguins here in Youngstown. You're either a Steelers fan or a Brown fan on Sunday, but on Saturday you are always a Penguin fan. Now, there's, there's an obelite. I wonder if that's a Penguin on a hockey stick. No, it couldn't be. They've got them all locked up. they got them all locked up. Oh, play on words. <laughs> yes. Locked up, locked out. Well, they're talking as we speak. There's your worst you did. No, that's down. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Second down at eight. Dump off the harness. Over the 40, has the first down. Leon jumps the tackle. Alcorn appears to be going back to plan A, which was successful for them. I think you have to, and if you're Alcorn State, there's plenty of time left to score in the first half. Don't get it all in one play. Take the ball down, make it a 42-21 game, and go in and talk about it at halftime. Youngstown State, you can see, 
after the turnovers. Four turnovers, 28 points. Four turnovers and one box five, 28 points. Youngstown now has the dime package in. Number 27, Ramon Emil is in as linebacker. So they have six defensive backs in the football game. Let's see how McNair reacts to this cover. He's going over the middle, has his man, Corey White. First down yardage inside the 35 to 45 to the 43. To Reggie Brown Marie attack. White. Nice job by Corey White coming back to the football. It's something you don't see young wide receivers do enough of. Deep curl route. McNair puts the ball where it needs to be. Corey White comes back to the football in between defenders, and that's why the play is successful. Good catch by the junior out of Port Gibson, Mississippi. First and ten for all corn at the 44. Air to the sideline again. Jenkins tries to sidestep his man, but steps out of bounds. Dwayne cups it on the coverage for Youngstown State. That, Short game. That play is here Tackle all day if they want. And they've got to be Thompson. consistent. Take it, take it, take it. And then if Steve McNair or somebody could sneak down deep, that's fine. But you got to pick your shot. Pick your opportunities against this defense. They're too well coached to give up the big play. 2.53 to go in the half. Each team has two timeouts left. Youngstown State with a 42-14 lead, second and two for all court. Almost a free play the way they throw the ball. Over the middle, Jenkins finally breaks loose. Jones, the tackle. You know, Youngstown State doing a great job covering, but nobody's even coming at McNair on some of these passes. They are content in this situation. Is that Kobe Jenkins? Yeah, Jenkins is slow getting up, number 86. Good collision on him by Leon Jones, their All-American inside linebacker. If he's unable to go, Shalonzo Miller will take his place. Jenkins, a very slippery receiver, usually catches balls along the sideline, but this is over the middle. And you're liable to get hit there. Leon Jones, just a one-on-one -on -one tackle right on the hip, and that's a very painful injury. If he's got a hip pointer, he's going to feel that for a while. And that will be a big loss for McNair and Alcorn State. Jenkins really is coming to his own this year, the sophomore out of Jackson. Six catches on the day for 51 yards already. So that brings him up to 76 catches on the season. He's just had a monster season stepping in and stepping it up because Marcus Hinton had the stress fat fracture in the leg. Well, Chris Fowler, Lee Corso, and Craig James standing by at halftime. We'll take an updated look at the Heisman race, a preview of Oklahoma and Nebraska. Actually, a look at Oklahoma and Nebraska. That game, I believe, down in Norman today. Big one for undefeated Nebraska. Hoping to stay ahead on the chase for the national championship and scores and highlights of all the other action today in college football. That's coming up at halftime. Chris Fowler and the gang standing by. Tim McNair helping Kobe Jenkins off the field. Won't speculate as to the type of injury, but he doesn't look like he knows what town he's in right now. Look at the fellows hanging out by the heater there. <laughs> well, when you're from Mississippi, you do that, see? <laughs> this is a Mississippi-type weather. Yeah, Kobe really took a shot there on that hip. Replacing it will be number 82, Shalonzo Miller, and there are the heaters. Again. Now, this is a fairly benign day for you and I coming yeah. from the Northeast, Tom. We're used to this. Fellas are saying, hey, I'm not playing today. I'm right next to the box. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first and 10 at the 28 for Alcorn State. Under a rush is McNair, and he's going to go down. I think he went down on his own before he was taken down by McLeod. And he's getting up slowly. Fourth sack of the day on McNair. This has not happened often today, the pocket collapsing on him quickly, but Mike McLeod is having a big end of the season here. Young guy, a sophomore, but remember, he's a little older than most sophomores. He's had the last two years playing minor league baseball. Second down and 16. Second down and 16, they're working on Kobe Jenkins. On uh, the all-court state bench. Lost his six on that last play. McNair gets rid of it in a hurry before he was sacked again and hits himself with a helmet. He was trying for harness across the middle that's the first time we have seen man-to-man -man coverage in the secondary since the touchdown early in the football game he knew he had an opportunity to make a play there and they didn't make it happen that'll bring up third down at 16. what happens when you try to get pressure on the quarterback the secondary forced into man-to-man -man coverage and he just throws it away 
Dribble wide receiver to the top of the screen now. Hinton to the bottom on third and 16. McNair to the sideline to Tim McNair, but does he have enough for the first down? Randy Smith on the tackle. It's tough to tell from this vantage point. I think he's going to be short, even though it is difficult to tell. Bring up fourth down. And we're from a very low vantage point here today. At uh, He's going to have seven or eight to go oh, still. There you go. We're at an angle and we're low. So if we, if we lose sight, our depth perception is off. You'll know why. But well, we've got this pole in front helping us out. Yeah, the pole helps us out for it. All right, fourth down and six. is caught by Sharon Harness. And out of bounds he goes, stopping the clock. Leon Jones over there. Depends on the mark. Did he get I it? I don't know. Sure. He might. Well. First down, Youngstown State. They take over on down. That hurt. All four needed to put points on the board before halftime, and that hurt. And when I say points on the board, I mean for Alcorn, not for Youngstown. So the Penguins of Youngstown State will take over first and 10 at their own 19 with a minute one to go in the half. And Cardell Jones has some adjustments to make at halftime. Has to continue to do what he did on that last drive. Take what they're willing to give you. One guard with a play action. Got a wide open quickly down the middle. Now he's covered and almost intercepted. Richard White came over out of nowhere after his whistler appeared wide open. I thought they might throw the flag on Richard White, kind of a push off late. He was beat deep. That's a heck of a call there. Great call. It's a play action throwback into the deep seam. Whistler's got him. You can see the arm goes out over there a little bit. That's an iffy call. Second out and 10 for the 19. Wow, run guard going for the whole enchilada. If he throws that a, a couple of steps earlier, Whistler's still running. His Whistler was hooked by 8 and 10 yards at one point of that time. Flows quickly. And here's Pat. Pat is hit almost as soon as he takes the handoff. Derek Hooker, number 58, hit him along with Evan Doss. I like what Jim Trestle did, though. He took a shot. He took a shot right before halftime. Now he'll probably be content to just run the clock down and get into the halftime. Well, the clock is running as you brought up. It's 30 seconds and counting. I'll have to run one more play. I'm really impressed by the, the whole program here at Youngstown State. It's a great tradition. The kids believe in themselves, and they play all three parts of the game solid, offense, defense, and special teams. Very impressive first half today. You can see why they're right number one. There goes Patton. Couple of men will keep him from the end zone. White and Bell bring him down with four seconds left in the half. See if they call a timeout. 25-yard gain for Patton. Oh, why not? Take another shot at it. Timeout is called by Young State. Yep. State. Yep. He could be an assistant for Jim Dressel. You two think alike? Four seconds left to go here in the first half. There'll be at least one more play coming up when we return. It's 42 to 14, Youngstown. Kyle Stambaugh Stadium, Carnell Jones and his uh, Alcorn State Braves being scalped so far in the first half. Four seconds to go in the half. One more play for Brungard and Youngstown. Brungard deep over the middle, has his man. That's Whistler. He gets away. Finally, Bell forces him out of bounds to end the first half of play. Well, they call this place Stambaugh Stadium, but affectionately known as the Ice Castle, and now we know why, Mike. <laughs> Not too bad today. 42 to 14. That's our halftime score. Some flags after the end of action of the first half. Now let's go back to the studio and Chris Fowler. All right, Tom, we should tell you that Steve McNair has engineered 11 comeback victories in the last two years, but none of them against Youngstown State in the Ice Castle, down by 28 points. We'll talk about Her uh, McNair's Heisman candidacy coming up at halftime as well as scores and the highlights of Division 1A games going on as Craig and Lee join me when we come back. Check.
Eastern Ohio, Youngstown to be exact, as we get start for, uh, get ready for the start of the third quarter of our Division One AA playoff game today. Cardell Jones and his all-court state Rays uh, in pretty deep this afternoon against the undefeated number one ranked team in the country, the Penguins of Youngstown State coming out of their locker room. Tom Mees and Mike Mayock back with you, and Mike, Youngstown is up by 28 points. They're slated to get the kickoff to open the second half. They're sitting in Fat City. You know, when you're down 28 points, you've got to start over the defensive end. You can talk about Steve McNair, you can talk about Alcorn State's offense all you want, but if they don't start stopping this Youngstown State offense, they've got no shot at closing the gap here. Well, this is Alcorn State's second venture into the 1AA playoffs. The first one was a complete disaster at Northeast Louisiana, giving up 78 points and a loss. And uh, so far in the first half here, Youngstown State has scored 42 points, some by means of an excellent offensive unit, some on the defensive side. So now It's really come three different ways. There's a good look at the touchdown pass. Nice job holding onto the ball, waiting for the zones to clear. Timmy McNair catches the pass. Now McNair back again, and he was intercepted three times in the first half. This is one of them. That's Pellucci, redshirt freshman, did a great job underneath in the zone coverage. And Sean Patton has had a pretty good half as well. Good front, good block up front. No problem for Sean Patton. And Youngstown State has taken advantage of just about every break that Alcorn has given them, and the breaks they made themselves. Here again is another rushing touchdown for Sean Patton. Here's Alcorn State kicking off to start the second half and returning it now for the Penguins is Randy Smith. Smith is over the 25-yard line of the 27. We have word from the Alcorn sidelines that Steve McNair may be done for the day. Number 10, um, Andre Krenn is warming up. McNair is just now being escorted by a Mississippi State Trooper. And there's his backup, Andre Credit. We'll uh, find the answer to that question when Alcorn State gets the ball back. Well, he's not carrying a helmet at this point. I don't know what that means, but he certainly didn't have the mobility in the first half that we've seen before, Tom. All right, first things first. Youngstown State starts off with a 28-point lead, first and 10 of their own 27. And Brungard hands off to Patton. Big hole up the middle for Patton, and there he goes! Just tripped up! Inside the 10 yard line, Richard White may have gotten a hand on a foot and that saved the score. Just seeing a continuation of that late second quarter, Youngstown State's offensive line has established control of the line of scrimmage. Simple play in isolation, good blocks up front by 78 Ray Miller, number 49 Dan Inglis, and now it's a foot race. 27, Richard White catches him down inside the 10 yard line. Officially down on the seven. First and goal from there. I do my arithmetic correctly. That's a 73-yard run. Thereabouts, about a 70-yard run. And the give is to Nakia Hendricks. Short yardage up the middle. Well, now McNair Jack came out without a helmet, Marcus but he Crawley. is throwing uh, the football. Andre Credit is back. Up. Looks yeah, like he meant business on the sidelines. So he warmed up, but apparently McNair will come back in. But that's uh, that's the storyline now. The storyline is Youngstown Second State down, threatening here, Mike, to really blow this thing open for good. Like we said at the top of the second half, they've got to establish some control defensively or this game's going to get out of hand very quickly. Second down and six. Back again. This time he is caught in the backfield. Mike Rano, Sidney Middleton on the tackle, big number 79. A freshman out of Forest, Mississippi brought him down. Big fellow, 6'1", 270. Penetration is your defense's biggest ally down near the goal line, and that's what happened. Middleton slices inside, makes the play for a loss. Big play for Alcorn State, a loss of three on the play. Or, yes, a loss of three. It'll be third down and goal from the 10 different offensive package in the in the football game right now you've got two tight ends wide one wide receiver and two backs Boykin is the only wide receiver he's spread out to the top of the screen make the patent jump off touchdown Nathan Toy freshman running back 10 yard touchdown pass look out it may be over 
Let me tell you what happened there. They put Coy, who's usually a tailback, and they snuck him into the fullback position, and they did it for a reason. They wanted to throw the football to him. Play action. He sneaks out into the flat. Touchdown. When Youngstown State does things personnel-wise, you've got to pay attention because they do it for a reason. So many weapons for this Youngstown State club. So many offensive schemes. Such a well-schooled defense as well. No wonder they're unbeaten. They're ranked number one in the country. And the extra point is good. A 49 to 14 score. They waste little time. Jim Trestle's team on the board in less than two minutes. And a 35-point lead at home. Football Stadium in Youngstown, Ohio. It's a bit of a blowout now. 49 to 14. You're looking at number 10, Andre Credit, maybe the loneliest man in the country. Why? He's the backup to Steve McNair. Coming into last week's game, he had only seven pass attempts on the season had two more last week we'll see if he'll replace McNair who is nowhere near 100 percent the kickoff meanwhile by Youngstown State goes out of bounds that's been an occurring problem with them an ongoing problem and therefore Alcorn will take over first and ten at the 35. that's why Massaro lost his job this week to John Dorma because he's got a propensity to throw the ball out of bounds well excuse me kick it out of bounds Steve McNair could use a crutch but he's going on the field anyway this is the way he gutted out the second half last week against Jackson State. And the numbers he put up last week, 90% of them were in the first half when he was healthy and escaping people and running all over the place. Uh, basically, he played the second half of last week's game on one leg. Well, his passing numbers in the first half, look at them. A 26 for 42 attempts. But if you, if you get rid of those three interceptions, two of which were bad decisions, it's not a bad half. No. So first attempt for Alcorn for the 35, and Youngstown knows they have to throw every play, but then again, don't they anyway? Yep. The difference is the passes might have to go deeper, like this one to Tim McNair. He gets it for a first down inside the 50-yard line, inside the Youngstown territory of the 48. Randy Smith, the tackle. Wow. Trips to the field. Nice job throwing the deep comeback route. That's Timmy McNair's fourth catch for 65 yards. Tim McNair has three single seeds in the reception records at Alcorn State. Receptions in a season, yards in a season, and touchdowns in a season. That's a triple crown for a receiver. Yeah. McNair, lots of time. Gets it off just in time, and good defense that time by Randy Smith on Donald Ross. Time is hit perfectly. Well, more college football action tomorrow on ESPN from the Big Ten. Number two, Penn State at home in Happy Valley, finishing up the regular season against Michigan State. 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 Pacific time. And then at 7.30 tomorrow night, we'll go to the Orange Bowl. Miami, Florida playing that team from <laughs> Chestnut Hill, a Boston, uh, Boston uh, college, right? Something like that. Something like that. Tenth anniversary of the pass. Never forget that game as long as I live. Steve McNair going to the sidelines. Ross is open this time. They give him tons of room. He has the first down at the 34. Let's check in with Chris Fowler. Tom, one more wild moment from that Virginia NC State game. Wolfpack had taken a 30 to 25 lead when making the interception on the two point conversion try is Joe Crocker. He's going to take it the other way. That cut the Wolfpack lead to three points, but NC State now has the ball trying to run out the clock. And Texas Tech has fallen to TCU. Could be a five-way tie atop the Southwest Conference if Rice wins tomorrow. But Tech goes to the console. All right, back here in Youngstown. Immediately, it's McNair to the air. Ross has it for a very short game. I never thought I'd ever see a four-point turnaround in football, but I have. Especially on an extra point. Yeah. <laughs> Usually, it's a term reserved for basketball. Your attention. They, they, they're running up and down the field, Virginia and NC State, like a lot of teams in the SWAC do. Scrambling at all court play the game, first game of the season, 63-56. Second down and eight. Everybody wanted to get just the right shot of this one today. Three more rounds to go for the eventual champion, whoever that may be. Pass complete from McNair to Harness. Leon Jones dumps him out inside the 30. Southwestern Athletic Conference, 0 for 15 and counting. And down by a bunch on the road at number 16. I'm really impressed by the inside linebackers for 
Youngstown State. Leon Jones and Reggie Lee are big-time players. They can hit, they can run, and they're showing today they can also cover the pass coverage team. They're down at five. Triple receivers to the top. Pressure is on. Tim McNair, good defense in front of him again, Reggie Brown. We'll bring up a fourth, but you would have to think that it doesn't matter. Every series is four down territory for all time. Excellent job here by Reggie Brown. He's in two deep, man under. That means he's got man-to-man -man all the way across the field on Timmy McNair. You can see him shadowing, closing on the football, and knocking the football down. Great job by Reggie Brown, the strong safety. That breaks up a fourth down and five. Grambling is the leader in the swag conference. You may be saying around the country, why aren't they here? Well, to be in the playoffs, you have to be able to play on the first Saturday after Thanksgiving, and Grambling prefers to play Southern in the Bayou Classic every year. That'll be on tomorrow. So that's why they're not in the playoffs. They make that decision to play Southern rather than play in the playoffs. And here's the pass complete to Kobe Jenkins, who's back from that injury in the first half, and he picks up a first down. To number 86, Kobe Jenkins. But uh, Grambling and Southern have that long, long rivalry, the and they would rather fill up the Louisiana Mays. Superdome and play that Good than uh, either school State going to the Division I AA playoffs. That's their decision. And it's an interesting dilemma. Yeah. Well, big, they need the money. dollars yep. in the pockets for the school versus not really making anything and getting maybe a, just a little bit uh, more attention for being in the playoffs. First and 10 for the 17. So Alcorn threatening to come back. After Youngstown over the second half. Wide open on that pattern all day. Jerome on is inside the 10. Tangled short of the 5 by Reginald Lee, but that play has been there when the game was tight and when the game isn't tight. Excellent drive once again for Alcorn. They did it well in the second quarter. Look at today's attendance, a new record, and that's because they sold standing room only in the north end, near north end zone, almost 18,000 people in the ice gap. Making it a warmer place. <laughs> There's the view that we have of the stands here at Stamboff Stadium, Beanie Field and Youngstown. They're measuring now to see if that, where exactly uh, that tackle was made. And an official's timeout. The ball is being held at about the eight-yard line. Harness has ten catches on the day out of the backfield. We'll see if he got ten yards on that one. Harness is a productive kid coming into the game today. He only had 36 rushing attempts, but eight of them were for touchdowns. Here's a first down, making it first and goal at about the seven-yard line. Situation where Steve McNair needs to be patient again. He's got four downs to get it in the end zone. They're not going to be kicking the field goal. Wait until you get the right opportunity and then drill it in there. 49 to 14. Chris Fowler said it correctly. McNair's engineered a lot of comebacks, but never by this much over a team this good outside of the state of Mississippi. It's like man coverage down here. They're going to probably double one Steve McNair. Timmy McNair, excuse me. He's open at the five, steps out at the four. Vance Mays was there to make sure he stepped out. That's a safety valve. Looks like Vance McNair takes a look Mays. at the triple wide receivers, Mike, and then that's always there, that, that safety valve pass out of the backfield. Well, this drive, he's done a great job of taking exactly what the defense will give him, and I think had he done that in the first half, in the second quarter more specifically, we'd have a good football game. Second and goal from the four. Power up. Double the football game. Second and goal from the four. Power eye. Double tight end. Wow. Betrell Shelby and Harness in there. Here's Harness fumbling the football. Who's got it? Youngstown appeared to have it but hold everything. Alcorn keeps it. Alcorn State retains. You know why that happened? It's because of the hamstring. He can't even get to the mesh point for the handoff. He delivers the ball, I think, right on the hip. Let's take a look at this. Watch him limp out. He's under center, not in the gun. He's going to struggle just to get to the mesh point right there, mm. and the ball is delivered on his hip. Mm. Tough way to play a football game. Caden Bernardo, freshman out of Magnolia, Mississippi, helped to recover that football, so it remains third and goal from the four. 
What is third and goal from the floor? Cardell Jones is I'm, I'm really surprised. I thought they'd go back to the gun here, especially with the problem he had after the last snap from center. They give to Harness again. Another fumble. And this one is picked off. Randy Smith. He may go coast to coast. And there will be 11 Youngstown guys in that end zone with him. 95 yards. Game set and match. It's now 55 to 14. No problems with the handoff that time. That was just a good defensive hit. And then Randy Smith takes it coast to coast. Same play, other side. The ball gets in the harness's hands. Inside, inside out. Leon Jones, number 50 with the strip. And Randy Smith is gone. I'm very impressed, not only with Randy Smith, but with the play of Leon Jones today. Tommy, I'll tell you right now, Leon Jones and Reggie Lee can play for me anytime at any level. They're just hard-nosed, tough football but players. But don't you know the competition they play? They're not up for the high. <laughs> <Be quiet. laughs> Extra point is up and good. Ten minutes, five seconds left in the third quarter. I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> Touchdown. Pressing on towards state. There's no other way to say it. Well, you're tired of turkey sandwich leftovers. What about penguin on a stick, Mike? <laughs> Fat free. It's not what I had last night anyway. <laughs> well, Steve McNair, seen better days. Last time Alcorn was in the playoffs, 1992, lost to Northeast Louisiana by a lopsided margin. McNair saw that one. And it appears his college career will come to an end here today on an equally lopsided legend. Penguins kick it off again. Corey White at the 10. Up the middle, over the 25-yard line, at the 26. And that's where all Corn State will put it in play. Philip Woods made the tackle. You know, Tom, one of the reasons that Youngstown State is so good. Do we have a new quarterback? No. Nope. Nope. One of the reasons they're so good is turnover differential. Youngstown State is solid. They pride themselves on that. And today, Alcorn's turned the ball over five times and one botched punt. Youngstown's turned it over once. Four, four turnover differential. Youngstown's plus 15 on the season. No difference. 56 to 14. About all McNair can do now is just uh, close the show. The only way he knows how to keep on doing what he does best. Show that football. Harness again. Another fumble. It's loose, and Youngstown has it. Well, your receivers can't hang on to the ball, and your running back's fumble. You're in deep trouble. Now, the, the route is on, and Pellucci and Reggie Lee are the two guys that make the hit here and force the fumble, but you've got to hold on to the football. Cardell Jones will drive that message home, I'm sure, when he meets with his team after the season. You're going to see Pellucci, the freshman corner, and, and Reggie Lee from the inside out. Good collision on the sideline, but you've got to hold on to the football. Almost all Pellucci on the on the hit. Where are they tough? And recovering that football was JT Del Garbino. So six turnovers to one. And Brungard and company start on the all coin 30. Patton, he fumbles the football. Number three. And all coin motions they have it. The official does as well, so back-to-back -back turnovers. Reminder, coming up later this afternoon at 4 Eastern Time, it's Georgia Tech in Georgia, one of the grand old rivalries of the South. The Ramblin' Wreck go between the hedges to meet the Bulldogs. You'll see it live at 4 o'clock, 1 Pacific Time, right here on ESPN. The win there could soothe a lot of wounds for Georgia Tech. Of course, Georgia is not having the best of seasons either. Eric Zier's last game as a college quarterback. I had an opportunity to see him play earlier this year. He had a tough day in Vanderbilt. He really locked himself out of the high season. First and 10 of the 30. And the pass is complete for all corn state to number 47, Betrell Shelby. Tom Palucci makes the tackle. Shelby near first down yardage and a flag of the play. Leon Jones and Tom Palucci on the tackle. Tom Pellucci's had a nice game today for a guy mm. that wasn't even scheduled to start. Usually plays behind number four, Vance Mays. 
Freshman out of Warren, Ohio. Let's listen to the penalty. Foul. Yep. I guess the microphone is not operating correctly after the play. So they'll tack on 15 yards. Dead ball foul. And it's uh, in Youngstown territory at the 46. But the Penguins could care less about that. They're up 56 to 14 and basically marking time the next week against either Boston University or Eastern Kentucky. Well, that game will be played tomorrow, along with seven others. Pocket steps up and hits his man over the middle. Marcus Marcus Hinton, the catch. Reggie Brown and Leon Jones bring him down. One of the reasons that he has not been able to get the ball deep down the field is you can see Marcus Hinton limping off the field. He's had a recurring problem with his calf all season. Is how deep this secondary is playing. Look at them at the snap of the football, 17 yards off the line of scrimmage, a soft, two deep zone, and the only place to go is underneath. He's just not going to be able to attack them down the field. First and 10 at the Youngstown 32. Over the middle again, has his man Kobe Jenkins inside the 25 to the 23. Jones the tackle. Well, the combination of an opportunistic Youngstown defense, a very well-drilled offense, and turnovers have really done in Alcorn State today. I just can't tell you how impressed I am with the soundness of this football club in all three phases of the game. They really believe their offense is part of their defense by not giving up turnovers. They believe the defense is part of the offense by generating them. And special teams, forget about it. They're the most well-drilled special teams unit at this level in the country. Quick to the sideline has his man Ross as the Youngstown State defenders laying way off their men. Dwayne Thompson, the tackle. That'll be a first down for all court. How good is this Youngstown 19, State team? Well, talk about teams of the 90s, winning percentage. Youngstown State, the best. Eastern Kentucky Blue always in the Northern Blue Iowa. Blue Marshall and rather the same, my Blue Hens are in that group. But how'd they sneak in there? Well, they, they win a lot. You know, when I saw the graphic <laughs> earlier, they only had the top three. I, they really had to dig there yeah, to get the Hens in there. We spare no effort <laughs> in that department. Love my association. Appreciate it. Here's the McNair trying to get away. Just can't do it. The tackle made by Tom Dillingham, and they help him up. The Youngstown players know the deal. They know that uh, McNair is not 100%. Fifth sack of the day. Tom Dillingham's first sack of the season. He, McNair limping noticeably now. Half this club is limping. Kobe Jenkins is lift, limping. Marcus Hinton is limping. Your quarterback is limping. But we can't give any excuse to the Youngstown no. State. This is a better football club, regardless of who's hurt and who's not. Or Alcorn. Just a better team, that's all. Youngstown's just a better team. Look there. And I believe a short hop catch that time. Yep, hit the ground first. Patrell Shelby. Paolucci was in the area. Shelby did a nice job playing shortstop there on the, on the one hopper. That'll bring up a third down and 15 at the 16. Pretty good quarterback at the University of Delaware. We talked about Youngstown State with Jaworski and all the rest. Yeah. But how about at Delaware? Scotty Bruner. That's right. Scott Bruner beat Youngstown State in the Division II title game. Jeff Tomlo. Yep. Had a couple of talks in the NFL. McNair. Got to get 15 yards at least. Dumps it across the middle to Jenkins, and he's surrounded. It's almost nothing. I think Tomlo's cup of coffee lasted about nine or ten years. But never in a starring role. <laughs> okay, he's got a pension and he's doing all right. That bring Tom, that'll bring up fourth and about 14 yards. They gotta get to the one yard line. They're allowing just 8.5 points a game. Slippery Rock was the most slippery of opponents, putting 17 up there. Alcorn is at 14 and counting on fourth down. And a timeout is requested by whom, Mr. Referee? By Youngstown. Youngstown State. He was confused, referee. He can't get it right. How are we supposed to know? <laughs> 6.34 left to go here in the third quarter. And yes, Sports Center will be next. 
after the Georgia Georgia Tech game or thereabouts. We'll be back to Youngstown in a moment. Trestle, his seventh playoff appearance. Two national titles, and they want him for the Heisman. Hey, why not, right? Why not, indeed? It's open, not only Division I coaches, right? <laughs> what's, what's the what's the trophy for coach of the year, anyway? All right, fourth down and 11, or 12, here for Alcorn State. Over the middle to Colby Jenkins, he can't hang on. He was close to first down yardage, but he couldn't hang on. Ramon Amelia was in there defending. That's their dime package. Emil in for the linebacker. They gave him a blitz three read and then dropped into a two deep man under coverage. This is a catch that Kobe Jenkins probably usually makes right here on the crossing pattern. He's got the linebacker who's also the sixth defensive back closing, but that's a catch Jenkins should make. 6.30 to go in the third quarter and Youngstown staking out your calculators. 56 points and counting. Reminder that NFL action returns Sunday night on ESPN. Drew Bledsoe, the Patriots, Marshall Falk, and the Indianapolis Colts. Airtime 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, a crucial game for the playoff hopes for each season. So the competition will be fast and furious from the RCA Dome in Indianapolis. Sean Patton begins this series for Youngstown State. Strips up at about the 24. You know, Tom, since about late in the first quarter, this offensive line has just dominated. 78, Ray Miller's having a big game. He's pushing the pile, allowing Sean Patton into the secondary again. And Patton leaves. Nakia Hendricks comes in for him. Ray Miller is 6'3", 308 pounds. He, along with the center next to him, Chris Samarone, are the two senior co-captains. And these guys were fun to talk to yesterday. The big ugly. You said that, not me. <laughs> The handoff is stopped for a loss. Bryant Mix was there to make the tackle. The give was to Nathan Toy. Might refuse it the next time. If there's been a good battle up front, it's been with Bryant Mix. He's the one guy big enough and strong enough and quick enough to deal with this offensive line. He's had a good football game. The much maligned Alcorn State defense, most people will tell you there are two legitimate, real, real good players on it. Bryant Mix, the nose tackle, Jermaine Brown, the linebacker along with Marcus Collins. Well, there's also two preseason All-Americans that aren't playing today, and we ought to talk about those guys in a minute. They're down at one. And somebody jumped to where they draw it. I tell you, when Middleton gets his 270 pounds in motion, it's tough to stop. <laughs> Sidney knows what he did. He already walked back yep. six yards. He's ready for, for the penalty. But Dead ball the foul. start of the season. Encroachment on the defense. Results in a first down. Sidney Middleton, 79, the top of your screen right there. Watch him jump. Mm. You get that much inertia moving forward, there's no way you're going to stop it. He's only 6'5", 270. And yes, he's only a freshman out of Forest, Mississippi. Seven sacks. And hasn't missed a meal. <laughs> first down and 10 at the 29. Run guard. He's in trouble now, got to get away, he does so, he got away from Middleton. And Brian Mix comes back to get him at the 32, short of the first down. Nice job getting away from uh, Howard Mosby there in the backfield. Brungard showing some athletic ability. Here we go, down the line, option, now they drop back in the play action pass. He's going to do a good job getting away from Mosby, 78. Cuts it back into the middle of the field and picks up what he can. This kid is a good quarterback, capable of taking him to the championship again. Second down at seven. Bungard, a 6'1 junior, out of New Middleton, Ohio. And here's the give to Nakia Hendricks. He's short of the first down at 35. I, I would have a hunch we're going to see a lot of running from Youngstown the rest of the day. Well, when they line up in that offset eye with Dan Inglis at fullback, it pretty much is going to tell you where they're going. They're going to go right behind him on an isolation block, either on the linebacker or the defensive end. Watch this offensive line surge. Big guys averaging about 290 across the front. Good block there by Inglis on the kick out. And you, like you said, Tommy, we're going to see that for the rest of the day with an occasional play action next in. Youngstown State. Is outperformed all court in all areas today. 95 yard fumble return for a touchdown, 90, uh, 94 yard interception return for a touchdown. A couple of big plays. 
Everything appears to go so smooth. They, they may be off their feet a little bit here with such a big lead. Nakia Hendricks did not uh, catch that one because Derek Cooker was there to nail him. When you play Youngstown State, you've got to be aware of the offensive personnel package in the ball game because that dictates what they try to do. With no mix in, two tight ends, three tight ends, three wides but you've got to be aware and substitute accordingly. A rare punt today for the Penguins. Grislinski on a nice spiraling punt. Singleton weighs for the fair catch and has it at the 14-yard line. 3.09 to go in the third quarter. A 52-yard punt. Youngstown in complete control of this 1AA playoff game. Well, and why not? They've owned this thing from the beginning until now. And the end is not too far away, 56 to 14. Jim Trestle is going to be ecstatic the way his team has played. Jim Trestle, just a heck of a coach, played for his dad in college at Baldwin Wallace. His father had a record of 155, 52, and 6. Chip off the old block. Puts the turnovers, though, 6 to 2, plus 4 for Youngstown. For the season, they were 5th plus 15. First and 10, Broncorn State at their own 14 after the punt. McNair completes it to Jenkins, who gets away from the initial tackler and should have first down yardage. Randy Smith runs him out. This is Division I AA playoff action, first round action on ESPN. Youngstown State defending national champions, 10-0-1. Later on this afternoon, Georgia Tech at Georgia. And Nebraska and Oklahoma are underway in the first quarter. You know, I, I think that's, that's an ambush waiting in Norman for Nebraska if they're not on their game. I think so also. I think they've got a couple ambushes waiting, but the second one I think they'll probably be ready for a little more. Miami? Yeah. They better be. In the 13, first to 10 for the 27. McNair, a sad sight as he just limps to the 30 and falls down. Friends, that, that, that's sad. That is a, a shame. And how about Leon Jones, the big hitter and linebacker? Yeah. Showing some compassion and not taking the shot when he could have. Well, good for him. Watch this. Just limps up the middle. See number 50, Leon Jones, cross your screen. He's the guy that could take a knockout shot if he wants it. Mm -hmm. And he pulls up when he sees McNair pull up. Yep. Uh, my hat's off to Mr. Jones. And a two, second down and eight. Jenkins, the cat. That is 35. Reggie Brown, the tackle. The, the thing that, that really is sad today, whether you whether you think Steve McNair deserves the Heisman Trophy or whether you don't, whatever your reasoning is, I think a lot of people tuned in today who maybe uh, have their first chance to sit down and really watch this kid, and it's a shame, really, from a competitive standpoint, I think, Mike, that he hasn't been nearly 100% to show what he really can do. Well, he just he's thrown for 401 yards today. We're still in the third quarter. The kid obviously has great ability, but I think it is fair to say he's certainly not at the top of the game. And when you're not against a great team like Youngstown State, you're going to fall behind by 56-14, which is the score. Remember this about McNair. He had 1,000 yards or nearly 1,000 yards rushing this year, so that is a big part of his game taken away. That's right, he had 930-some yards rushing, and you take that away, and you're losing almost 100 yards a game in offense. Nice hit there on that last play by Leon Jones. But Alcorn does keep possession. They pick up the first down. They'll mark it at the 38. 120 and running in the third quarter. Shelby breaks loose, and McNair forces it on the sidelines. Donald Ross was the intended receiver. Vance Mays almost picked it off. Excellent break on the football by number four, Vance Mays. But you talk about these brackets and who comes out of the game for next week, I don't think either BU or Eastern Kentucky is going to want any piece of Youngstown State next week. Well, they don't have much of a choice. <laughs> they, they sure don't. You know, the quarterback, of course, for Eastern Kentucky, one of the Saka brothers. Yep. John Saka. Former Penn State performer. That's right. Second down and 10. Over the middle again. Almost intercepted and knocked away by Lester Weaver. Kobe Jenkins, the intended receiver. I think that was Reggie Brown making the break on the ball there. Well, the hype stops here. Safety. They stay in the stands. You know, talking about John Saka and that whole Penn State situation, I really believe that Saka leaving Penn State allowed Collins to have the kind of year he's having this year. I think with the two of them there, neither of them was ever really comfortable at that number one spot. The old saying, if you have more than one quarterback, you really have none. Third down for McNair, steps up. 
can't run it, so throws it instead for Shelby, and interference is going to be flagged here on Vance Mays, and he's not going to argue about it, I don't believe. Too little, too late. Vance Mays makes the break on the ball a little bit too quickly. So that'll be a first down for Alcorn State. Steps up into the pocket as well as he can, delivers the ball. Boy, he has a strong arm. And there you can see the contacts. He did not pull a muscle on that arm last Saturday night. <laughs> he just has a gun. The ball will be just over midfield. They're trying to figure out where to mark it right now. You know, I talked to some I pro got people this week. On the defense, first down. Yes, and they said? About McNair. And I don't necessarily agree with this, but one of the concerns they have is his height. His height is marginal. Uh, he's listed at 6'3 in the program. He's 6'1 and 5'8 when he's measured. And there's only one starting quarterback in the whole NFL right now under 6'2, and that's Blake. Uh, so I don't agree with that. I think the NFL too many times tries to fit thing in, things into the computer, yep. and it, it spits out no. I think this gives a player no matter what. Well, he plays this year on Saturdays. He will play on Sundays next year somewhere. McNair all to the middle. So Tim McNair, another first down at the 35-yard line. Emil was there. Steve McNair's pass complete to number seven. 13 yard gain. Well, he'll have respectable yardage totals at the end of this one, but his team is getting crushed. And he has uh, been intercepted a few times today. In uh, sacked a few times, which yeah. usually doesn't happen. I think uh, Lee Corson and Craig James made a, made a good point at halftime and that the, those who are on the fence coming in probably are going to be swayed away from Steve McGarry after this performance. But we've got to be careful in not taking anything away from the Jonestown State team. We're a better football team, the defending national champs. They deserve the respect. Kobe Jenkins at the 30 gets no respect at all from Reginald Lee. Amelia and Lee bring him down. I tell you, the five defensive backs in the game and those two inside linebackers just fly around the football field making plays. I really like it. The, scene, the defensive backs, all four starters, are seniors. They've been around. All of them have started at least three years, with Lester Weaver being a captain, Reggie Brown a four-year starter, Randy Smith a four-year starter. That's the strength of this team, the inside backers and secondary. They won't get the snap off before the end of the third quarter. Three quarters in the books here. And Jim Dressel is happy and why not? The Youngstown State Penguins, undefeated on the season, have a 56-14 lead. One quarter to go before they sit and wait to see who they'll play next week. Usually you see penguins, you see snow, you see ice, right? That's right, well, and, and they're proud to be penguins here in Youngstown, and why not? They get the best 1AA team in the country, they're pounding the opposition, and I, for one, Mike, am glad to see a bunch of penguins who are playing. <laughs> I didn't know that was coming. Oh, I had to get there somehow. McNair hassled from behind, somehow got that off intended for Singleton, and he is slow getting up. Well, a courageous effort by McNair, but I'll tell you what, you knew last week when the matchups were announced, Mike, that Alcorn was going to be in deep against Youngstown State. Well, you look at the legacy in front of you on the screen right now, 93 national champs, 92, they lost to Marshall in the national championship, 91, they win it again. As I mentioned earlier, really only Eastern Kentucky and Georgia Southern have any kind of legacy that can match up with this. Third and five for Alcorn after the incompletion. The completion to Jenkins, uh, I don't know if he got the first down. Amelia Jones brought him down. And the referee is calling for a timeout, maybe for a measurement. It's real close, right on the line. First down. Now they are, uh, well, yeah, they are moving the chains. Okay. Again, we have a low vantage point, so peripheral vision is at a premium today. We have to wait for the official signal. Pretty good contact here by Ramon Emil. Watch him come in late. Bang. And that's the last thing Kobe wants, because watch him great. Grab that left hip real quickly. First and 10 of the 25. Remember, 17 points, the most given up in a game this year by Youngstown State. Jenkins. Brought down by Reggie Brown. So this Youngstown de defense has given up a lot of yardage yeah. here in the second half, an entire in the game, but they haven't given up any points since late in the first quarter. And a lot of yardage when the game was out of hand, too. Yeah, they, they went even deeper on that soft zone. I would think for the defensive unit's pride here, they want to really try and keep Alcourt from scoring. McNair has 
Thomas is banned on the flag after the catch. We may have had interference anyway by Reggie Brown, but it doesn't matter. Toby Jenkins caught it. You mentioned pride of the defense. Two of the kids we had a chance to speak to yesterday were free safety Luster Weaver and inside linebacker Reggie Lee. And they couldn't stop talking about pride. And another word that came in was respect, something they don't think they have a whole lot of yep. around the country. And I really believe this whole team wanted to make a statement today. Well, they certainly have, loud and clear, as the officials talk it over. I mean, you pick up uh, USA Today this morning, two articles on McNair. McNair's Heisman chances may uh, get a boost on national TV. People are going to be tuning in to see Stephen Yard. Not a, hardly a word about Youngstown State. And that uh, ticked those guys off, and frankly, I don't blame them. I don't blame Jim Trestle and his kids, and that could be a great motivating factor. I don't blame you. Jim Trestle has built a foundation here for success. It's the most successful program in the country at this point at that we are level. holding on the defense. First down. And these seniors that have been here for this is their fourth year, they can be one of the first classes in the history of Division I AA football to play in a national championship game all four of their years. That's incredible. It really is. Well, an automatic first down after the defensive holding. Well, Reggie Lee yesterday had two big rings on his fingers yesterday. He said, i got to have a third. <laughs> well, it's Christmas time. He's another president. First down at 10 of the 11. McNair just losing it for the back of the end zone. Actually thrown that away. Tim McNair, the closest to it. But we said up top, in the red zone, he's looking for one guy, and that's his brother, Timmy. He had tunnel vision that time. He was looking for Tim McNair the whole time. Check, check it out. He's looking for Tim, looking for Tim, looking for Tim. There he is. Throw it away. Well, the winner of this game, which will be Youngstown State, will now sit and wait, watch tomorrow's Eastern Kentucky-Boston University outcome, because uh, that would be the next opponent for the Penguins. Where are that game? Where to be determined. Another one for the back of the end zone, overthrowing number 82, and that's Delonzo Miller. At some point here, we're now in the beginning of the fourth quarter. I would imagine after this drive, you might start to see some of the backups for Youngstown State working in. 70 pass attempts today. But I think what's going to happen if you're Youngstown State, you don't want to take a chance. Let's face it, their season continues next week. Right. This isn't the end of the season for them. So let's get some of the big guys out of there and make sure they're ready for next week. They're down at 10. He throws it and a touchdown. It is caught by Shalonzo Miller for the score. And at least all I can say, we scored more points against these guys than anybody. A nice job both by Miller and by McNair. McNair held on to the ball, waved Miller to the corner because Miller was running an in route. He had the common sense to cut it outside when the quarterback cut it to the outside also, as you can see here. McNair is going to buy time by moving outside. Nothing's there. Continues to move, continues to move, and finally Miller breaks from the inside back outside for six. And David Jacana into the 10th dance the court. And they're going to botch that up. That was not held. And Youngstown State, they could run this back, you know, but they'll just fall on it. And that'll end that. So it's 56 to 20 with 13 13 to play. And we'll take a commercial break while McNair sits on the Alcorn bench and commiserates Youngstown State well in control of this one. Welcome back to Stambaugh Stadium in Youngstown, Ohio. Like Mayock and Tom Bees, we have 13-13 to go here in the fourth quarter. What has turned into a route, frankly, in the first round of the Division I AA playoffs. Youngstown State in control. And returning this kickoff. That's uh, Nakia Hendricks. will check out the yardage in a moment. Let's check in with Chris Fowler. Tom, we watch the one double-A team. It's ranked number one, Grolling. The top-ranked one-A team, Nebraska, is down in Norman. And Brooke Behringer sacked for the second time. The Huskers have to settle for an Ersad field goal. Early second, three-zip. You know the best part about that? Natural grass in Norman. I love that. Isn't that nice to see? That's great. And visually appealing. And I'm not surprised that's a tight game. A lot of people just are looking forward to the game against the Miami and the Orange Bowl. I can't forget about Oklahoma. A lot of emotional factors in that game that you can't discount. 
Gary Gibbs, of course, coaching his exactly. last game. First and ten for a Youngstown at the 27. One guard still in there. Sean Patton ahead for a couple of yards. Reminder of college basketball action of plenty. That's later on this evening. We'll begin in Massachusetts, Springfield to be exact. UMass in Arkansas, two of the top teams in the country. The starter tip off classic at 7.30 Eastern time. Followed by the NIT preseason championship. Live from Madison Square Garden in New York at 9.30 Eastern. That's Ohio and New Mexico State. Basketball doubleheader tonight after our football doubleheader this afternoon on ESPN for your holiday viewing enjoyment. UMass is missing a starter, aren't they tonight? Michael Williams out? I, I think he is. I couldn't I say. He so immersed getting got, ready for his football game. Got a suspension. I think he misses tonight. That will hurt UMass. That will hurt UMass. That's the truth. Darnell Bracey making his first reception of the afternoon, number 13. Are you surprised the front guard's still in here? Uh, I made the comment about a minute and a half ago. I thought it was time to start working the men. Uh, I, I'd get him out real soon. I, I think I'd get Pat now. I think I'd get most of the starters out of there. That's a typical Mark Brungard type of day. High completion percentage and no interception. You got all the parts that this Penguin team has. You don't have to throw the ball 70 times in a game. No doubt about that. Very well-rounded squad. Boykin makes the catch. He's got the first down, and he's tackled inside of 45 to 44. And Bell brings him down for all torn. I think Coach Tressel would just kind of like to see him work on a few things. Maybe get an opportunity to throw the ball a little bit more. Good play action series here. Fake the Patton. He's going to get the deep curl into Boykin. Against the zone. Nice job. 17-yard gain. Ball marked to the Alcorn, Alcorn 44. 11.45 and running here in the fourth quarter. There's Boykin from Kent, Ohio. Those are the kind of guys I used to hate to try and tackle. 5-5, five, five, you never seem to get a solid shot on them because they're so quick. That was your excuse, right? I had a bunch of them. <laughs> oh, look at this. Whistler coming around. Taking a pitch. Going to catch up to him. He'll gain a couple, but he'll pay the price. Whistler ran a long way to get hit. <laughs> Carlos Thornton got him. Carlos Thornton ran a long way, too. But it's, it's, you don't mind it if you're doing the hitting. I think this is something just to show on film next week and make him prepare. Zwizzler's not the guy you do this to anyway. He runs about, you know, about a 4-7-40 here. He's not the guy you flip this play to. I think they're trying to give BU or Eastern Kentucky a little something to think about. Actually, that was uh, Calvin Robinson making the initial hit. Thornton uh, closed the deal. Second out of nine. Gain of one. Rushing yardage. Well, it's uh, self-explanatory. Yes. Five sacks. Nope. Bring that total well below the middle of the line. Here's pass interference, obviously, against Dante Dowers of Alcorn State. Boykin was the intended receiver. Boykin working the same route. He worked two plays ago. This time it was man coverage. It was just a deep curl pattern. Very obvious pass interference penalty on Dowers. Ground level shot coming right at you. Deep curl route. There's the contact. Pardon me while I try and pick this football off. <laughs> well, I've seen Dowries make some Passing good plays this year. That wasn't one of them. On the defense. First down. So first and ten at the 30. My guess is Trestle told his offensive guys, let's one more series. Let's try and put it in the end zone. If you give me one series into the end zone, we're out. Back to the eye behind front guard. Point to the motion. For Boykin on the sideline, wide open, inside the 20 to the 18. Marcus Colley made the tackle, and Colley gets that flipping. Tackled by number 37, Marcus Colley. Boykin had 140 career catches coming into today, which was number three on the all-time list. He was only 10 behind uh, Rick Sheepus, who had 150. Picks up three more today. First and ten for Youngstown on the Alcorn 19. Boykin and Zwistler both go to the top of the screen. Play action. Don't 
for the end zone. Touchdown, Whistler. That is the exact same play that clicked in the first half. Both corner routes, Whistler man-to-man covers with Richard White, and he took him to school on the post cut before breaking outside. Same play. And they ring up another six points. Play action. He's going Swizzler the whole way. Takes him inside on the corner, post route, back out to the corner. No shot for Richard White. Third reception of the day for Swizzler, 80 yards total, 19 on that reception. And two touchdowns. That's yeah. not a bad ratio, two out of three. At six touchdowns of the season coming in, so he's ahead of the average here. Extra point is academic and through 63 to 20. Youngstown State is well, we've known for some time on its way to the second round, the quarterfinal round of the Division One AA playoff. All that remains is to play out the last 10 minutes and 42 seconds. It's been that kind of day in Youngstown. Now, an OC 320, your score, Youngstown State. Most points ever scored by the Youngstown State team, beating the 59 they scored against Northeastern on September 28th of 91. For that, every Northeastern grant in the country is thankful. That name is now off the list. Here's Gory White of Alcorn, trying to do some business on the ensuing kickoff, and he's not going anywhere. Except down rudely at the 12-yard line. So Alcorn comes back down on the field. Let's see if the camera will remain. I, I have a hot step for what I saw last week, but he's going to cut this out to the end, and he's coming back on the field. I'm trying to take a look at the uh, the two deep right now for Youngstown and see if they're going to substitute. And they still have most of their first team guys in there. Next time Alcorn's invited, they may refuse. Last time in 92, lost 78-27. This time, not much better. It's 63 to 20, and we've got 10 minutes to go. Well, what they have to do is they've got to win that bid to host the game, so they don't have to come up here in the Northeast and play a cold weather game. Well, the atmosphere would be a lot warmer in Mississippi. I don't think the outcome would be any different. Yeah. No, it's, it's a better football team. No, no question. But it would be nice to be a warmer climb. They go down into the week. McNair looking left, looking right. Colby Jenkins, who I think is going to be a real good receiver. I think he's already real good. He's going to be has the, maybe a great receiver by the time he graduates. He stepped it up big time for only a sophomore. Anytime you catch 70 passes in a season, you're already a good football player. First down catch. Capability. That's the one thing that really separated McNair from a lot of quarterbacks, and he has not had that today. Is that Jenkins again up at the 30-yard line, or that's uh, Alonzo Miller? Alonzo Miller, let's check in with Chris Fowler. Well, we're checking out the scoreboard, Chris. If you can hear us, Nebraska leading three zip. We understand all that. Oklahoma's defense is uh, putting a rush on the Nebraska quarterbacks today. Well, the quarterback. So far, quarterback. Second down to one, gain of nine. <laughs> Donald Ross stays in bounds, makes the first down catch, and is stopped up at the 44-yard line. Reggie Brown and Randy Smith. But that pass gives you an idea of, of the arm strength of McNair. Far hash mark, throwing the deep 17-yard comeback on this hash mark without a leg to push off. That's just great arm strength. And you're right, you know, strictly speaking, statistically speaking, McNair's going to have excellent yardage totals today. Pretty good pass completion percentage, but his team is nowhere near in this game. Hey, that's a gun right there. That's an absolute gun. dumps over the middle and it's caught by Patrell Shelby into Youngstown territory at the 49. Leon Jones the tackle. Number 47, Patrell Shelby. You know, we should mention that that last touchdown pass as Whistler cost Ron Jaworski another hundred dollars. Well, he can afford it, but why does it cost him another hundred? <laughs> Being a Youngstown State grad, he, he donates a hundred dollars towards their general scholarship fund for every touchdown pass. Well, He's going to have to write a decent check after today's game. And after this season. Come on, Over the middle. 
Wide open is Tim McNair. First down at the 35-yard line. Maybe just inside it. Ramon Amelie brought him down. Speaking of scholarships, we ought to talk a little bit about the structure of 1AA football. 1A football, you're allowed 85 full scholarships, and that's usually doled out one per player. At this level, what happens is you're allowed 57 scholarships, and the neat thing is the coach can divide it up any way he wants. So you might have 90 kids on the team all getting a partial scholarship, but it can't total more than 57. I'll bet number nine gets a full ride. <laughs> I like to go out in the ledge. <laughs> and down goes McNair. He may have lost possession. They call him down by contact or not. They, I think they're giving Alcorn the benefit of the doubt here because I thought that was a fumble. Well, Steve ended up on top of it anyway. In the area was Todd Collar. He pleaded his case to the official, but Alcorn will retain possession. Call this sack Steve number McNair, six on Steve McNair. You can see he just doesn't have the escape ability that he usually does. He no. just does a great job getting the football back. I'm telling you, if he were 100% today, Youngstown would have won the game maybe easily, but you would have seen a, a different kind of athlete. A different athlete. There's just no getting around that. Over the middle and incomplete to Jenkins. Reggie Brown defending. About a half hour from now, Georgia Tech and Georgia between the hedges, 4 Eastern and 1 Pacific time. Another renewal of that classic Southern rivalry. Neat place to watch a football game. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Eric Zier's last college game. Hoping to go out a winner. He, too, will play on Sundays next year. Yes, he will. Another guy with a concern about his height. Another guy with great numbers, but once again, when they measure him, he's going to be in the 6'2 range. They're down at 19 to go. McNair will throw into the shadows and has Donald Loss. Mark Carter brings him out, stays in bounds. We'll have to see where they mark him. We get the first down. They're beginning to move. Once again, I apologize for not being able to tell you, but our depth perception is nil. You know what? Donald Ross has really had a solid football game today. Good wide receiver. He's already he's got 10 catches for 109 yards. He came into this game with 39 catches on the year. He runs a 4-5-40. Solid football player. He's an up and comer at all. Corny had three touchdown catches last Saturday against Jackson State. And four against Tennessee Chat. Yep. Move and box. Pass intended for number 82 Miller, Shalonzo Miller. And Gory White almost ended up with a deflection. Looks like he was confused about whether to catch it or, or to play World Cup soccer with huh. it. That'll stop the clock, 6.53 to go. He was looking for his brother, Timmy, down the deep middle, but two deep zone took care of that. Comes late. You'll see Miller with the extension. The ball goes up in the air. Corey White almost pulls it down. Second attempt. From the 23. Wide open is Tim McNair, but he started to trip. Maybe he's tired. Now, these guys are running so many patterns today. You think about it. Think about how many snaps they've taken, which is plus or minus 80 by this time. They're in trips every set, and they're running a minimum of 10 to 15 yards every time. And then you come back without a huddle. Well, we've been informed a new Division 1AA playoff record. 80 pass attempts today for Steve McNair. So that's a new record. His personal record was 69. Past that. And we've just been informed here at the stadium that Youngstown will host a game next week against the winner of Eastern Kentucky and Boston U. So Boston U and Eastern Kentucky, beware. <laughs> You've got to come here to the Palace. Corey White with, with what would be a miraculous catch. Do they give it to him? And I think they are. I thought it bounced back into his hand. Off the, off the ground. So do the fans. They're discussing it, but it's 63 to 20. You wonder <laughs> why, <laughs> frankly. Yeah, I wonder that myself. Meanwhile, the clock continues to roll. I'm not sure it should be, but I don't think the officials... You and I aren't arguing. Here's a good look at it now. Throwing the ball to Glory White. Oh, hit the ground and yeah. he just lands on top of it. That's an incompletion, and I think they've ruled it so, yes. Well, right. they made the proper call. Unfortunately, they did stop the clock there. But... Six minutes even. 
incomplete. That'll bring up a fourth down and ten. Total domination by Youngstown State today. McNair is going to have good numbers. Team is not going to come close, but it was a valiant physical effort by Stephen there in his final college game. Over the middle and almost oh. intercepted. Having a beat on it was Art Carter, the sophomore out of Youngstown. Art Carter with a nice break on the football there. And depending upon how long this drive lasts for Youngstown State, that may have been the last pass of McNair's collegiate career. And here comes relief in for Youngstown State at the quarterback position. Brungard is being taken out and gets a deserved applause along with many of the first string offensive performers for Jim Tressel. Coming in is Omari Parks, number 11. He'll run the show at quarterback. And we should say at this point, that what a great job by the offensive coordinator for Youngstown State, Mark Asher and John Klasik. <laughs> They'd also like to say hello to their families, except especially Mr. Asher's family down in Arkansas. Oh, excuse me, it's not Parks, it's Demond Tidwell, number 10. Parks had thrown it out of the field, but Tidwell, freshman quarterback, is in there. Running the show now for Youngstown. You know who their emergency quarterback is in case something crazy happened and they both went down to be wide receiver Don Zwizzler. Wow. High school quarterback. Youngstown Look at State that. In a losing cause, McNair has thrown for 516 Kentucky. yards, three touchdowns. Winner. He's had three intercepted. Next Saturday, 52 out of 82. You know, if you take out the interceptions in the score, it looks like he had a great day. Right. But you can't. <laughs> That's exactly right. Tidwell. Hands the ball off to number 33. The Oreo. Jermaine Brown, the tackle. At this point, I think we're just going to see DeMond Tidwell handing off. Trying to run this clock down. Well, they better gain nine yards. They're down to nine. Diorio and Inglis, the running backs behind Tidwell. Let's see if he'll throw one up here at third and nine. He's going to give it a go on play action. Across the middle and almost intercepted by Jermaine Brown. That's why Jermaine Devon lines up Tidwell the linebacker and not to tight end or something. He's got hands Aaron like feet. Conrad so young Sal will punt it away. Number 48, Jermaine Brown on the Before coverage. the season started, Alcorn the lost their best cornerback, all preseason All-American, Malcolm Jones. And about four weeks into it, they lost the preseason SWAC Defensive Player of the Year, Alan Haynes. It's been a tough season defensively for Alcorn. Yes, it has. Single and singles for a fair catch in the shadow. Can Hamlin then jump forward? Is he recovered or not? Who's got it? Youngstown State has it, according to the referee. And that turnover differential continues to pile up in favor of Youngstown State. It's number seven, right? I believe it's seven versus one. So Youngstown State will stay at home. They'll win today. They'll have that extra day of rest. They'll uh, keep an eye on the scene tomorrow between Boston University and Eastern Kentucky. Either one of those teams, I think, is going to give a test to Youngstown State. Uh, that's, that's, and from that point on, it's good, solid football. Today they had to get past Steve McNair, which they've done. But from this point on, it's anybody's ball game. Enter the doors of the South Tower. So Young South recovers the muff putt. And away they'll go. Nathan Toy takes the handoff. Collie the tackle. And either way, they'll be playing against somebody who's used to some cold weather also. Terriers from BU or Eastern Kentucky. I really don't think either of those groups are going to be faced. There's Brungard. Got some ice on his right elbow. Number 48, Jermaine Very solid game. Very solid quarterback. Use the right word there. Solid. He is coming in. He's got better than a 2-1 to one touchdown to interception ratio. And that's what this club does is they don't give you an opportunity to beat them because they don't beat themselves. to the tailback, Omari Parks, and Parks inside the 30 to the 28. Marcus Colley, the tackle. Georgia, Georgia Tech is next on ESPN. 
four Eastern, one Pacific time. Three and a half still to go in this one, but we'll get you down between the hedges on time. Don't worry. Eric Zier is finale as the Georgia Bulldog quarterback, and the officials are discussing something at about the 30-yard line. A late flag, and I mean real late. Uh, Jim Tressel, I'm sure, will maybe give the squad tomorrow off. What do you think? No. No? Absolutely With not. With eight days in between games? No. I think I've got a dead ball foul, personal foul, on the offense, first and ten. Well, now, he said personal foul offense, and then pointed the other way. <laughs> no, I, I'll try and figure out these messages, conflicting signals. Does he work in the NFL? Or... <laughs> I think what Trestle will probably do is bring the kids in tomorrow to watch film, watch the tapes of the game, and kind of get them back to, back to ground zero again about we've got a heck of a game coming up. Let's come watch some tape of Eastern Kentucky or BU, and let's, he might give them Sunday off, but I think they're back to work tomorrow. Meanwhile, the all-court state sidelines are already starting to pack the footballs. They're arguing with an equipment manager over whose footballs are who. And some dejection, but you know what? I don't think these kids from Mississippi can feel too bad. They've just been totally pounded today and by a better football team. I think it's easier to take the feet when you know you didn't have a shot. Yeah, I don't think the feet taste real good either way, but... There's no Marks. Yeah, Marks, uh, collar by Bryant Mix. He'll be back next year for Cardell Jones. And that may be the only warm person in the stadium. <laughs> First down, 11 yard gain. Real six to go. And it certainly did. Monday. And they had good uh, air security around the stadium today. That young man is taking it laying down. Straight ahead running again. Nathan Toy, the carrier. A defensive coordinator, John Haycock, from Youngstown State, told me a couple of days ago that as far as he was concerned, no big plays were going to happen against his defense. He was going to get in the deep zone, change up a little bit underneath, make him uh, McNair read some coverages, but he was not going to let them beat him deep. And that's exactly what happened today. Second down and eight. At the all coin 31. It's a matter of count. 2.20 to go. A record performance by the Youngstown State Penguins today. 63 points on the board. And basically what they're doing now is running out the clock. Well, they won it last year. And they also won it back in 1991. This is the end of the game, we understand, in 91. Looks like against Marshall. Yep. Yes, it is. The Not thundering anywhere. herd. And Youngstown State won that. That game was played in Statesboro, Georgia. Last year, they went down to Huntington, West Virginia and beat Marshall at their home field. And, and please understand, these kids are on a mission, just like that year in 91. We asked them a question yesterday. What, what if you guys lose to Steve McNair tomorrow? What if you lose the following week? Has it been a great season for you guys? And they looked at me like I was crazy. Mm -hmm. They said, you don't understand. Here at Youngstown State, with the standard of excellence, if we don't win the national championship, it's a bad year. Well, they got it rolling, that's for sure. Steve McNair, well, he's having a laugh, and don't misinterpret that. He cares deeply whether his team wins or not, but uh, one of the great college careers, whether he wins the Heisman Trophy or not, you've seen it conclude here today on ESPN. Yeah, I, I think on that sideline, it's just time to shake hands and say, hey, we had a great year. Thanks, guys. You know, we're seniors. We gave it a great run. We got something to be proud about. And if Southern should upset Grambling tomorrow in the Bayou Classic, they would still end the year tied with Grambling for the flat title. Right. They're down at six. Under two minutes to play, as you see. Tidwell going to give it another go. Via the airway. Into the end zone and knocked away. Richard White knocked it out of bounds. A little surprised to see him throw play action into the end zone right now with a minute 30 and up by 63 to 20. But, <laughs> you know, I have mixed emotions. You want to see the kids that get in have an opportunity yeah, to try and play, but on the other hand, um, you know, I, I'm not a big one for trying to score 70 either. Eh. Hey, he's a freshman. Live with it. <laughs> Let him get in there and throw one. I know what you're saying, though. Fourth down and seven, and they're not going to punt here. They're going to go for it. Down the line goes Tidwell. He's going to have the first down. Look at this. Inside the 
15 of the 14. Alentante Bell brought him down. Little speed option. Pitch man was taken away. Tidwell does a good job turning it up the field. Calvin Robinson took away the pitch. 16 yard gain. That'll stop the clock on the first down with a buck 24 to go. Now they'll start it up again. Now here's where the pride of a second team comes into play. These guys are in the huddle saying, let's get one. Steve McNair has probably thrown his last collegiate pass, but he'll heal that hamstring. I'm sure he'll be watching the NFL draft on the ESPN. From springtime. Tidwell cuts it back in again, but he can't escape the grasp this time of Lawrence Hill. Or rather, rather Derek Cooper. I'll tell you what will be interesting for McNair is that he's scheduled to play in the Senior Bowl right now. Yeah. And that's where that whole level of competition theory goes out the window. You go to the Senior Bowl, it's not a vacation. You go there to work, you're coached by the pro scouts, yep. you're timed by the pro scouts, and everything is geared towards finding out which guys are the first rounders, which guys are the second rounders, and which guys fall further down. And his leg healed by that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't think we'll have a problem. Okay. As long as he's not torn, he'll be fine. Under a minute to play. Second down and five on the nine. Parks. And he's hit behind the line of scrimmage. Scan for the Sean Benton. Sean Benton.